Trevor live. Okay, everyone. I want to call the meeting to order. We have quorum now for the purposes of taking evidence. So can I remind members that this fully virtual meeting is being broadcast online and we are live at the minute. So the following members are present at the meeting via video conference. Myself, Emma Shear in the chair. We've got Mike Nesbitt, our vice chair. We've got Paula Bradshaw, Carol McCullen, Michelle McLevin and Christopher Stalford. The first First item on our agenda today is apologies, and we don't have any apologies, but we don't yet have Mark Durkin um, in the meeting, so he may join us later on. So we can move now into the second item on our card today. We've got a briefing from the Youth Forum, Children and Young People's Rights, and the Youth Forum have provided us with a, a presentation uh, via PowerPoint. So at this point, I want to welcome the Youth Forum and Chris, their, their leader, into the meeting, if you want to begin your presentation. Okay, yeah, is that us live, Emma? You're live, yeah. So I believe today you're being well, you're being joined by a number of members of the Youth Forum. We've got Jack Dalzell, who is an NIYF member from Ards and North Down. We've got Kira Hesketh, who's an NIF. YF member from Trans Youth Forum. We've got Naomi Salon, who's an executive member of the forum. Sarah Khan, an NIYF member, NIHE Youth Forum. Yourself, Chris Quinn, the Transitional Director, and Natalie Corbett, who's Participation Development Worker. Yeah. yeah over to you. Listen, thanks so much. Um, uh, we've, uh, we're really welcome the opportunity to be in today, and we have a short presentation for you um, and then some space for a discussion afterwards. Um, as you say, the young people have joined us, and there, there's a few there's a few young people here quite nervous at the moment. But I've, I've told them just to relax and try and enjoy the experience. Um, and I think being online makes those nerves a little bit uh, a little bit more um, magnified. Uh, but I'm sure they'll do a great job. Um, so N Natalie's going to uh, share a presentation at the moment. Uh, in a moment, I'm not sure if you can see that right now. Can you? It's not popped up on the screen just yet, Chris. No. no. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, put the, we'll get the presentation up and we'll just run you through it real quickly. Um, but as we do that, just a real quick bit of background. Uh, the Youth Forum is a youth-led organisation. Uh, we've, been, um, we've been established since 1979 and we're governed by, um, by young people. Uh, so there's, there's 12 uh, young people sitting on our executive committee and they set our strategy. So it looks like our presentation is ready to go. Is it? I, I saw it there, but I can't now. Is it? Can you see it? No, no. I think. Well, listen. I'll talk through it, and hopefully, hopefully, um, it'll it'll pop up as I go. Um, but I guess the the, the first slide that I was going to talk to was just a wee bit of background. Um, so it just talks to the fact that as a youth forum, we've looked at this issue quite a bit over this past decade or more. Um, and in 2010 and 2015, we've done some quite extensive work on a Bill of Rights. Uh, we hosted a number of events and engaged in the consultation in 2015. And young people um, spoke to us too overwhelmingly. Young people felt that a Bill of Rights was important and that uh, young people's, there should be special protection for children and young people within that. Um, so we talked a lot about the UN Committee um, on the Rights of the Child in 2015-16 had recommended to the UK government that a Bill of Rights be implemented in NIASAP. Um, we've also talked a little bit around um, young people, and particularly those young people aged between 18 and 25, who are sometimes the most vulnerable. And you'll hear a little bit more in our presentation about uh, the challenges that asylum-seeking young people and those with disabilities um, face. Um, with examples about how legislation that was about to go through the Assembly in the past, um, namely the, the goods, facilities and services, um, uh, legislation would have actually discriminated against those under 16. So I guess that's an example for us as to why we need a Bill of Rights that, that includes um, the UN Convention within it. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted on child and youth rights. Um, so I, th I think we're still having a wee te te technical difficulty with the presentation. Um, but I'm presuming you still can't see it, no? 
Chris, it's popping up there intermittently, but I should have said members can find the presentation at page 13 of their pack, so we can okay. follow along on our devices. So thank you. So don't worry too much. I know the technology can, can fail us at these um, moments. No problem. Well, just, just again, um, in the lead up to this presentation, we had done a workshop uh, in February of this year with young people. And there was a good, there was a good maybe 30 young people attended that workshop from a, a, a range of constituent groups. And young people talked to us about underpinning principles and key issues that should be within the Bill of Rights. Um, and a lot of the stuff they talked about was uh, included access to services, the legal protection, education, jobs, health care. There was a big discussion around COVID-19 and particularly education. And there was conversation with regards to socioeconomic rights. And young people felt strongly that often that they are, they are the big losers when it comes to economic rights in terms of welfare reform, housing benefits, minimum wage and discrimination against young people. Um, we talked around underpinning principles um, to include the, the NCRC uh, treaties and conventions. Young people talked a little bit about uh, the Good Friday Agreement and they talked around accountability uh, and enforcement. So how, if we have a Bill of Rights, can we build accountability into that? Um, so I'm going to pass over now to young people, which I'm sure you'll find a lot more interesting than my input. Um, so Sayira is going to talk a little bit about her lived experience as a young person who's seeking asylum and how a Bill of Rights, in her opinion, might protect her um, in her life. So, uh, over to you, Sayira. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Khan, and I am and have been an asylum seeker for the past seven years. Um, I'm just here to like touch on subjects that I feel kind of impact young people that are asylum seekers. Um, I'm going to start off with a quote. Um, the aim is to create here in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. And this was a quote directly from Theresa May when introducing the Immigration Act of 2016, which is also known as the hostile environment policy. Another quote from it was, to stop migrants being able to access the essentials or in ordinary life. An assessment of this policy showed that the Home Office was in violation of sex, Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010. Inadequate legal representation People seeking asylum and refugees are not informed of their rights and are usually given the bare minimum when it comes to representation. They're usually misrepresented by lawyers who make little attempt to actually listen to their clients, often ignoring their calls. In 2018, there was a legal aid cut that resulted in less legal and competent representation. Naveed is a, P a Pakistani refugee, and this is what he was quoted as saying. By the time I found a solicitor, I didn't have time to understand or prepare for my interviews. Students seeking asylum have had their tertiary education treated like a lottery, with only four scholarships being offered in Northern Ireland. These scholarships have unrealistic criteria that only allow certain su subjects to be studied, which leaves pupils with little to no options. UCAS can be quoted as saying, in the UK, people seeking refugee protection can't access higher education. Although they've come here legally fleeing persecution to claim asylum under the international law, the UK classes asylum seekers as international students. They are charged international fees and are unable to access student loans. Media and stereotyping. The media portrays asylum seekers and refugees as thieves that aim to steal resources from citizens. This media portrayal alongside the hostile policy condones abusive behavior from people of authority all the way down to the local neighbors. During the COVID crisis, the rise in hate crimes against Asians rose by 300%. What the media doesn't show are chartered ghost flights that are paid for by, the tax, by tax money. Between 2019 and 2020, the UK government spent £7.4 billion on 23 chartered deportation flights with an average of 24 people per plane and £205,000 per flight, equaling to 10000 per person. For scale, the average business flight costs £5,000. This has resulted in a distrust amongst asylum seekers and refugees towards police and people of authority. I'd like to pass over to Naomi Sloan. Thank you, Sarah. So my 
um, my my bit of presentation will be on disability. And as a disabled person myself, I have had many lived experiences that I don't want to bring attention to. Under the NCRC Article 23, it's stated, if I have a disability, I have the right to specialist care and education. But in true reality, that is a postcode lottery. The Education Authority made cuts as soon as they moved away from the Education and Library Board. They also, it is... The schools can use it as a recommended advice that is not always recommending that the child or child or young people in need will get. So the statements that are put in place are reviewed every six months. Over the last over the last year, there has been one thousand statements due for review that have not due to COVID nineteen, and a further two thousand five hundred waiting approval from the education authority. Yet these children are still expected to go to school and learn like their peers. The consequences of that is that uh, children with severe special needs will no longer get the support they need. If a child has severe autism and the school is aware of this, they are not allowed to put specialist care, such as classroom assistant, or adopt their education or plan, which is the, their personal education plan. Therefore, then children are being made to sit and suffer with peers that are um, neurotypical in that opinion. This is also being very true for students that are under university. Yes, our needs have been looked at and seen to, and they do what they can, but there has been a huge hold up as the Education Authority is also in charge of equipment and software. This has left to many pupils this year without the correct support or assistance, and many have not received their equipment, and now we are sitting in March. The other thing I would like to bring your attention to is the lack of funding. There seems to be a sort of... The way it was put was... If you're lucky, you'll get you'll get what you want. But in many schools, funding is determined by what the school can afford, and it has been found that schools are using this funding for other students and does not directly help the child in need. And the thing I would like to finish off and saying is the welfare of students is also being affected because Section seventy five is under the UNCRC and is not always followed or is pulled with other policies that make it harder for young people to actually get the access. I was turned away from a youth centre about three years ago. It was run under the Education Authority and was told I was too hard to handle. But I'm sitting in front of you today as a youth work student at Jordanstown in a full time placement. This is something me and the Education Authority can both not understand. Thank you. Now I'll pass over to Jack. Hi, I'm Jack, I'm 14, and I've been with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum for two years. At the start of the pandemic in March 2020, we brought together the Our Voices steering group to bring the voice of young people to be heard and speak truth to power. We conducted three pieces of research and have got 4,000 responses all together. Our latest survey was conducted in November 2020 and was the Our Voices group's largest survey yet. From this, we have linked UNCRC rights to some of the information we got back from the survey and how the rights may be being breached. Article 12, the right to have a say. We feel it is very important for young people to have a say in issues that affect them. From the response we got from the survey, it does not seem that young people are having a say in issues affecting them. 89% of respondents felt the, serve, felt the voice of young people ha has not been heard throughout COVID-19. Article 24, the right to health care. We feel the right to health care should not stop with physical health. Mental health is a huge issue with young people right now, and this is shown from our survey. 74% of respondents highlighted that they felt mental health, their mental health had deteriorated during the course of the pandemic. Mm. Article 13, the right to access information. Throughout the pandemic, there has been a lot of confusion and misinformation around what is a restriction and what is just guidance. In our survey, we had a question around this, and 55% of our respondents said they did not fully understand restrictions, rules, and regulations. And then Article 3, best interests of the child. Article 3 states that decisions should be made in the best interests of the child, although 45% of our survey respondents highlighted that they do not feel safe in their learning environment or workspace. And we feel that this is not in the best interest of the child, as a child should not have to feel worried or unsafe in school. I'm not going to, I'm now going to pass to Kira. Thank you, Jack.
Sorry, I was muted there. Um, hi, my name is Kara, and I've been part of the Youth Forum for about two years now um, with the Transing Youth Forum and now the Our Voices Group. Um, our top four issues for young people were their mental health and well-being being at 67% and isolation and loneliness being at 61%. Um, education learning at home and exams um, at 67% and boredom being at 56%. Um, Article 4 of the UNCRC says the government um, should make sure my rights are respected. Um, Article 15 says the right to meet friends and join groups. Um, Article 24 says the right to healthcare. Um, Article 28 and 29 um, explain the rights to education. And Article 31 says the right to play and relax. None of these rights have been um, with me, like from my own personal experience. Um, my grades have gotten worse since coronavirus, not even just from being in lockdown, just from September onwards. Um, and b even being in the house, I can't do any of my work. I have to do my both my parents' work and I have to do my younger sister's work with her because I'm the only one that is fluent in Irish in my house. And then I have to have time to relax, which I can't do, not in my house environment. It's a busy family. I can't do that. The resources and communication and overall teaching experience during coronavirus has been horrific. Um, I've lost all faith in my school, um, myself and my politicians making decisions about my education. Um, and even if we were to go back to normal, I don't think I'll get the grades that I, I, that I would have achieved and that I deserve. Now I'm going to pass on to Natalie. Um, hi everyone, thank you, Kira. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I have to apologise. Um, I've been having some technical difficulties sharing this screen, so hopefully you can see bits of it. Um, so yes, thanks to the young people who have presented today. So in terms of when we were planning this presentation, thinking about young people's rights, some thoughts of the young people and ourselves would be, how is the um, UNCRC going to be enshrined in law? It's okay to have an UNCRC, but we thought that if it was in law, then it would, people would have to uphold the rights better. Accountability, ensure that the Bill of Rights is enforceable. So moving forward, how is the Bill of Rights going to be enforceable within society? Will the Bill of Rights protect those seeking asylum? We heard from Sarah there earlier around her experience as a young person seeking asylum. So how is the Bill of Rights going to protect young people who are seeking asylum? Include age as an issue on the Bill of Rights and consider those aged 18 to 25 who often fall between the cracks. So how are 18 plus 18 to 25 year olds voice going to be captured and considered? Knowledge of rights. So if we do have a Bill of Rights, will people know how to use them? So could this is this something that the Bill of Rights could be included in the school curriculum, taught by teachers, youth workers, rights campaigners, etc. So it's okay having a Bill of Rights, but how are young people going to get this knowledge that those rights, that Bill of Rights is there to protect them? And also, what's the next step in this process? And how can young people continue to have a say in the Bill of Rights? And it's to ensure it's not just a, an ad hoc approach or a one-off event or focus focus group, a long-term mechanism to ensure that young people's voices are heard. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, I just want to thank people for listening. And I'm going to pass um, back to Chris. Chris, I'm not sure if you're trying to come in there or not. That apart from look, there's an opportunity here with, with submitted papers to you as well, um, which detail a lot of that. And um, I suppose now I would welcome the opportunity for a Q and A, and you know to talk further about some of the issues that young people have raised. Thanks very much, um, and and thanks to you all for for joining us this afternoon and for the the presentation and the oral submission. There, I have to say, you're all brilliant at, at getting your points across there, and that was that was really really helpful. Hearing the voices of young people and 
and getting it from your perspective. I know that I'd uh, met with some of you before in the TEO committee a few weeks ago. So I, I knew what to expect and uh, I was impressed again. Um, I want to direct my, my questions particularly at the uh, experiences given to us there from Sarah and Naomi. And I know that you're coming from different perspectives, but in terms of your access to rights, and this is something we've been talking about a lot when we're talking about a bill of rights. So Sarah, you've related your experience as an asylum seeker, and we can see very clearly that the British government, you referred yourself to the hostile environment policy, to the, I think that that um, mindset has been compounded by the, the use of terminology such as illegal aliens and as basically creating a, a, a system whereby human beings are treated as criminals um, for, for existing and for, for trying to, to get away from hardship. And then how, how that impacts on your ability to access rights. Naomi, you had referred to, to your experience as, as somebody living with disability, and perhaps no one would ever um, admit or say that they're stated intention was to discriminate against someone with a disability, but be it down to resources or a lack of understanding or knowledge, that, that your rights haven't been achieved. And I think in both of those instances, we can see very clearly that your rights haven't been prioritised. And my thinking as somebody that's involved in this process is that we should have a Bill of Rights to state that these things, that rights for all human beings, regardless of their background, should always be priority and equality of opportunity to services should always be a priority and that sets the bar then for governments for departments and for the people making decisions to act accordingly and i wondered if you would give us your thoughts on that um so i i would love um to be able to to say that i get treated um as equally as other people around me um but Unfortunately, that's not the fact. Um, I feel that often when our policy our policies are made public knowledge, which it always should be, it gives people the opportunity or at least the thought that they have a right to mistreat people. Um, and I think a lot of the times people will ask, why wouldn't you contact the police or why wouldn't you tell someone who is in authority when you have experienced hate crimes or discrimination. And although it is the law that it's not meant that, you know, hate crime is still a crime, I feel that it's something that people of authority kind of put on the back bench, you know, and it's um, even like with contacting the police, um, the police don't really take it as a serious offense. You know, they, they chalk it up to, oh, someone's ignorant or, someone it's just youngsters being youngsters but it does have an impact on our lives it has an impact on our our idea of safety uh, we've come from countries that we were used to violence and feeling in danger and coming to a country seeking for help and asylum and wanting to feel protected and safe and then having experiences that are completely new but still abusive is something that I feel was not taken seriously enough. Um, as as well with education, I think asylum seekers and refugees get put on the back burner for education as well. I mean, like I said before, um, there's only four scholarships available to asylum seekers, and if we don't get in for a scholarship, we have to pay international fees. And as it is, home fees are so expensive, international fees are even worse. Um, and it cuts our opportunity short. And then we get blamed for, for taking jobs and benefits and housing that we never intentionally wanted or tried to take. Thanks, Sarah, for, for that. I don't know, Naomi, if, if you wanted to, to come in. Or, yeah. or anyone else. Yeah, the well, I see it as I would love to live in a world where everyone just accepted as how the army all have the same level of rights, but growing up as a disabled young person, I can tell you that's not the truth. I don't see why we don't have the same level of care as a student that doesn't have all these extra needs, 
But we're now sort of made to feel like a burden because when we ask friends, we're like, well, can you not just see it or do it that way? And like, I'll bring an example to you. If my classroom assistant was ill, I was sent home and denied my right to education. I wasn't protected at all. This, there's law, but then it'll also come down to, well, is there different levels of law for who you are on your status? Like, is there a way of determining it? It's just not right at all. Um, could I just come in on the back of uh, Naomi there and just, just to relay some of the research that we have done with young people and workshops we've held, young people talked about what I would phrase as protection for all, especially the most disadvantaged and vulnerable. And the examples young people gave in workshops, they were asked that they feel that young people, that everyone experienced the same level of human rights. Um, and, and they get a, a really good discussion about different interest groups including the young, the elderly, the disabled, um, different uh, ability, disability, gender, ethnicity, all of these things. But then they get into a conversation about, right, okay, so what, what groups need special protection? And what if you fall across many of these groups? You know, what if not that we're trying to put people into pigeonholes, but you can be discriminated against based on falling into various categories, you know. Um, so they talked a lot about that and they talked a lot about um, inclusion and diversity, but but most of all, it was this, it was parity. You know, they talked about parity. Everyone should everyone should be treated as equal. Um, and then in, in order to do so, um, those who suffer most disadvantage and those most vulnerable perhaps need more protection than others. So it was just to jump in there. That was that came directly from our um our workshop in, in January, February there. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the key thing. And I suppose trying to draw out from, from what you're you're telling me in terms of your experiences, if we don't as a society make it very clear at the outset that we want to value everyone equally and we will do whatever it takes to make sure that everyone has the same access to rights it will naturally flow then that within society, people will treat you differently based on how they view your worth as a person. So it's about, you know, I think a Bill of Rights, we can talk about the implementation of that and how it works and the justiceability and all of that, and that's important. But it's setting that ground rule that as a society, we value everyone regardless of their, their circumstances. And we don't see them as a burden, as you said there, Naomi. We don't, you know, view somebody as a burden because they have particular additional needs in one particular aspect of their life. But thank you very much. I'm going to pass now to Mike and give him an opportunity to ask a question. Sure, thank you very much. And thank you all uh, for engaging with us uh, this afternoon. I have two or three areas I'd like to explore. Um, Kira was very passionate on, on education. I'll, I'll come to you in a sec. Kira, I also want to talk about the goods, facilities and services um, which, which didn't happen, and I chaired a committee that was looking at that in the last mandate. But, but the first one is a question about when you, you transfer from children or youth services to adult services, and maybe this is one uh, for you, Chris, uh, because I'm aware that there have often been horrendous problems. It's, it's not a kind of smooth transition, and people can fall through the cracks, to use that, that expression. Is, is that something that we could be looking at in terms of a Bill of Rights? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, look, this is something that I personally, personally feel really passionate about. Um, I feel that often those days, day 25, are some of the most vulnerable. Um, and a statistic that I can give you to back up that is that um, during the past year, um, through the course of the pandemic, 18 to 25 year old single males and females have become some of the most vulnerable in terms of housing. So the numbers of young, young people aged between 18 and 25 who are now living in temporary accommodation and have been in there for quite some time has raised fivefold. And I think you're right, Mike, about falling through the cracks. I mean, Natalie, you might want to come in here as well. I mean, we're, we're dealing with more and more young people in crisis in, in our work you know, on a daily basis. Um, and you, you'll know the work we've done, and you've done lots of work on, on mental health and well-being over the years. But um, the, the, amount, the numbers of young people in crisis right now is, is really scary. 
And I think that's one example. I mean, mental health is a really solid example of how we see young people falling through the cracks on a day and daily basis. Um, and often I, I wonder, I mean, I've been, I've been in hospitals with young people. I've been in front of healthcare professionals supporting young people. I've been with young, young people here. And I often question, well, if this, if this young person was of a different age, would they be offered a different service? And I, and I have seen that in my own life. I've seen people who are older uh, getting access to services, getting beds in, in hospitals when they really need them. And I've seen young people who have been in casualty basically saying to healthcare professionals, listen, if I go home, I don't know if I will be alive tomorrow. And that's that's a really horrible example. But but for me, it's a really stark example of whereby that age band, you know, this this 18 to 25 year old age band can often fall between those cracks. But Natalie, you have loads of experience in this. I don't know if you want to come in and say a little bit about that yourself. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I um, totally agree with everything that you said. Um, but yes, in terms of when you, the transition from child, adult or adolescence, where does that voice go and where, what happens to the young people in that transition? And, you know, I think COVID has for, um, further impacted or co compounded the issues that young people have been facing in terms of mental health. Do you know, I've been youth workers on the ground, frontline workers in terms of supporting young people at times through mental health crises. And I've sat in different um, arenas with, and advocating on behalf of young people for them to get the the support and services that they deserve um do you know and our research around covid and our voices is is indicated that young people's mental health is um people have said it's a lot worse now so it's around coming out of this what are we going to do moving out of this to ensure that young people's rights um are protected yeah and, and i think natalie you know, in terms of mental health if you're transferring into adult services it shouldn't be a gap absolutely yeah. But, but yeah. secondly, a young person shouldn't be re-traumatised by being forced to be reassessed or to tell their story again when they don't want to tell their story again because they don't have the mental capacity to, to do it without getting traumatised. Absolutely. My guy supported um, young people and um, they had to attend emergency services or even out of counselling and they go, what's the point? Because I have to do it all again and again and again. And as a youth worker, my, part of my role is to support young people, advocate for them but and still hope for them too in terms of there's therapeutic services here that are available but but they're getting let down time and time again um and then they have a, and, and they're saying things to me like but what's the point what's the point in speaking i'm not going back to hospital i'm not going back to that again so it's very difficult to manage you're doing great work with the toolkit by the way <laughs> so, Kira, uh, talking to people who aren't doing great work, you're, you're not happy with politicians, you're not happy with the educationalists. What, what, what should we be doing? You just need... There's so much things you can do. Because different... Obviously, different people need different needs. Like, I've been... I've had... I've went down Irish school my whole life. But for second... For my upper sixth year... And my lower sixth, I went in English school. So I'll see that transfers hard, but I've settled in well. But at the same time, it's it's still a bit difficult, do you know what I mean? And there's no sort like there's I'm not getting any support that it's obviously not it's not that big of a deal, but at the same time, like it's still there. And there's just no resources, there's no help, there's but there, as well, there's nothing that the school can do because no one's given them anything. Some people don't have laptops. Some people don't have the environment to be able to do Zoom calls, so schools aren't providing them because not everyone could do that. That would be a disadvantage to people who can't attend them. So some people are getting them because they can afford laptops, but some people aren't because they can't afford laptops. Do you know what I mean? It's just so hard. And in my house, my environment, it's there's seven people in this house. You can't get a free room. There's nowhere to do your work. I, I, I just can't do the work. Like It's so hard. And my mum and daddy are key workers, but why would why would they send us in at the risk of getting the virus when like your health is more important than anything else? Yeah. I, do I, I was shocked to hear Naomi say if, if her assistant is off sick, then she gets sent home. I mean, that doesn't happen with teachers. You know, there are supply teachers, there are teachers who will step up when people are sick. Uh, I'm going to ask a question to the Education Authority uh, about that, Naomi. Um, final question is about um, the goods, facilities and services. 
Um, and, and just kind of how upset you were that it, it was it was effectively blocked because there was a disagreement about whether young people should be included or not. Yeah, um, I'll be here, Mike, and, and please, young people, and Natalie, jump in as well. Yeah, that, that was a big one, and um, you'll be. I can remember conversations we had with yourself, uh, Mike, about it at the time, and. I remember going up to the executive with uh, a delegation of people, and I think Ikea, we we were in we were in conversations with the uh, aid sector platform as well. Eddie Lynch was the CEO there now, and he's now the Older People's Commissioner. And I have to say, it was really great that that whole. That whole um, campaign actually was a really good example of younger people and older people campaigning together. And I think when it came down to it, it was almost like our committee were really torn. You know, they were welcoming the fact that you might have legislation, but fearful that if this legislation was in place, it would never move. You know, so there was a, there was a thinking that, okay, if we get legislation in place, it might move to include under 16s. But, but at the time, our executive committee felt it was just getting that. It would have been too hard to move that piece, you know, once it was there. But I think, I mean, when when it was when you, when I was thinking there, Mike, I was out for a run the other day and I ran up the Falls Road and I saw a poster. It was a PSNI poster, and it was it depicted a group of young people. Um, two pictures, and one said. Uh, uh, parents' perception of what your children are doing, and it was young people sitting in a park on swings. And below it was uh, the reality, and it was a group of young people sitting having a drink. And I was going, if that's not, and I know I'm going a wee bit sideways on you here, but I was going, we need to challenge this. That's negative stereotyping of young people. Young people, that's, and if that was a picture of older people, <laughs> you know, the perception of older people. So there's all these examples, and I love the examples of shops. You know, I go down the Antrim Road and schools are open. I go down the Antrim Road every morning and there's a stack of school bags as high as the door at the spa at Carlisle Circus because young people are told, leave your bag at the door. You're not allowed in unless you leave your bag. You can't come in in more than twos or threes. And I'm going, if, if my granny was asked to leave her bag at the door, I know what I would do to that shopkeeper. I'd be straight down to the shopkeeper. And I know they're quite trivial examples but there are bigger examples I mean there were young people years ago um, there was a young person campaigning uh, around smear testing and she couldn't get a smear test because of her age um, there was mental health is another good example um, access I think access to services health, health services in general are a good example but I, I feel that you know, in my own community I see it all the time I see young people outside the local Tesco and I see them getting kicked out and I would ask them, well, why are you kicked out? Were you misbehaving? No, well, it's just the way they get treated. And it's accepted that you go to a leisure centre, you go to a shop, that we're young people. Listen, that's the way they get treated. So that, that was a big campaign for us. And hopefully we can revisit it in this mandate and, and, and get HGFS legislated for, but to include, to include younger children and young people. So hopefully that answers your question, Mike. And if anyone else wants to jump in, please do. No, that, that's, that's a good answer, Chris. And I'm particularly pleased to hear you say you were out for a run because every time I've seen you for the last year, you've been in that same seat. Thought <laughs> you were locked in for a while. I absolutely locked in, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. And thank, thank you, Chair. No problem. I've got Carol in the kitten and then Paula. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was powerful, I have to say. Um, and I met just before uh, around the Elephant in the Room campaign, which was absolutely class. Um, and so I'm going to disagree with you, Chris, on one issue. I don't accept party. I think we deserve better. And, I, and it's not like a, a scrap. It's just to say that, you know, sometimes party also means bringing bad practice and bad legislation. So the issue for me is particularly around the rights that everyone has outlined. Um, we there, there, there are particular circumstances and the bespoke rights. Like I have absolutely no doubt that, um, you know, if there was a, a single, if there was a single equality act incorporated within the Bill of Rights, that the issues that you're talking about could be legally challenged within 
uh, a court. In fact, some of the discrimination that you have experienced now could be legally challenged within a court. Um, so I suppose if, for example, you're you're basically saying that the United Nations um, uh, legislation or, United, or UNCRC um, how is that all going to be enforceable? So I, I, I guess you are asking that that's brought in to the Bill of Rights. And also, I'm not picking on Kara because she's a Gale Gore, so I'm just going to you know, use a, a, a couple of fuckle, um, you know, mass my lot. But um, so, and, you know, Shade of Oral, uh, like our Dr. Gilga D, um, you know, more like discrimination, August Kyrta Dana. Um, August, like um, Takiat, uh, Nura Vishay Oiga, or Skull, like 16 to 18, like Sh- Shade of Warl, Martian. So I basically ask Kira, did she feel, or would she feel, that um, certain protections around language rights, particularly an Irish language right or an Irish language act, may protect her in terms of having. Uh, more support in school as an Irish speaker in terms of getting more access to A-level classes because that's a big issue. And then the other aspect that I want to chase up on, and I think it'd be good for us to chase up on as well, is the whole thing around digital inequality as well. And it's not to pick out or despite what anybody has said. So I agree with everything you have all said, absolutely everything. And I just don't need to hear from people like me is oh, I agree with you and then we do nothing about it. So that's I'm just giving you a commitment. That's that's not what this committee's about. But one of the things I just I am concerned, first of all, Naomi, like Mike, if her classroom assistant was sick, she didn't get access to education. That's horrendous. And then we need to talk about digital inequality and and that impacts on everybody who spoke, um, particularly Sarah, because, you know, refugees and asylum seekers don't have rights at all. Frankly, they don't, because it's all transferred from the British Home Office. So it's just to say, my, from what I've heard, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that what you're saying is not only do you need the NCRC involved or being part of the Bill of Rights, but it needs to be done. The Bill of Rights needs to have legislation and it needs to be legally enforceable. So I'll just leave it at that. And Gormagov, Asin G's Baraksin, Inta Moyer Fad, thanks very much for the presentation. It was excellent. Kira, are you going there? And Carl, I have to say I'm very jealous of your Irish. I've, I've been a learner for many years. And uh, so that, that was that was class. How make follow Chris like the Tamaf Fashi Leafa must yeah. be here. They don't talk to me in any language, so there you go. It's the same in our house, but Kira, would you like to go first there? I, I can come in on some of it, but give young people the floor first, like. Yeah, it's alright, I don't mind. Um well yeah, I would agree. Like when I moved to Trinity, um Oh, the new that I had moved, it, it's never been really acknowledged. Like when I'm handed in work, it's always just like, oh, you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong. When I, I'm actually dyslexic as well. So not only do I have no services to help me, like even on top of that, I should be getting extra. Um, but it, there's just nothing like put in place at all. And even just like, because I do politics as well and the essays, there's no help for that. And because I've, I'm entitled to extra time, now I'm wondering when we go for these assessments in, like for this year in school, um, am I going to get the extra time that I need? Because I need someone to, because I get a scribe, I need someone to sit there and read and write for me because I just can't do it in time. But yeah, and especially even with, um, even with the digital technology, like, can't get all the services in Irish because I do Irish as well as for an A-level. You can't get all the services in Irish either and you can't get the resources. Like if I wanted to go and do my health and social work, I could go and find you know, like information, but it's so hard to find that in Irish. So yeah. I forgot what you said in the answer, sorry. Uh, any other young people wanna jump in before I go on a wee rant? Jack, you haven't. Jack, would you like to comment on Carol's question there about? So she asked about digital inequality. Uh, 
parity. Do you remember in our workshop, Jack, we talked about language of rights and parity and equality and equity? Um, and then the other question was about the NCRC. I know, you, I know you can talk about that one, Jack, for sure. Yeah, um, I'm very passionate around the UNCRC. I think it, sh it, it should be enshrined in law. Um, there's a lot of things in it that have been breached throughout the COVID-19, and if it was in law, that would be enforceable. But it's not, so there's nothing we can really do about it. So that's... Yeah, Jack's being very modest, Carl, because the first time I talked to him about this sort of stuff, um, we done our workshop with the Human Rights Commission and um, we done our debrief and he goes to me, Chris, see that ENCRC thing? Is that law? And I was like, Jack, you deserve a medal because that is, that's the key question for us. You're entirely right, Jack and Carol. That's the key question for us. You know, we've got this, we've got this thing and we've got the report to Geneva every few years and it's very well. I mean, we can hold people to account using the various articles within it, but until they're enshrined in legislation, they don't have really, they're not, they're not enforceable, you know. Um, and interestingly, um, the list of issues, so the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child have, have just published their list, list of issues. It was published on the 9th of February. And I'm glad to say that a lot of what we have spoke to you about is in the list of issues that they're asking the UK government. And on the very second page, it's, it's in the paragraph A, article E, it says, enact the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. So it's in here front and centre, and we're really glad to say that the UN committee are saying the same um, as us. Uh, and about, with, with regards to digital inequality, a lot, some of what our paper spoke to was about socioeconomic rights. And what we've experienced through this work and through COVID in particular is how, I guess, poverty. You know, poverty is, for me, the, it's, it's the driver, you know, one of the big drivers behind a lot of our issues. Um, and if we look at socioeconomic rights through any lens, and particularly through the lens of young people or students, there's Kira has described her scenario. So seven young people in her household competing for Wi-Fi to be educated and competing for laptops. Um, it's it's just impossible. Like, but I'm going to pause because I don't want to talk too much. Naomi, Sayira, would you like to come in there on any of those points? Just on your education point, Chris, um I, I, this is the thing I find difficult. I am also virtually learning from home from September, as all university students have been, either from campus or from home. I'm originally a Braille write, writer, and also that's, my, that's my first like written language. English isn't, but yet I can. I don't. Whenever you're on a digital computer, you can't touch and feel Braille. My tactile world was took away from me the minute COVID striked. Even going out shopping, that's another issue and a half for students. Obviously, having to go out shopping and like, live independently as they or live semi-independently, um, is that like I can't see any of my assignments in Braille, can't do any of my assignments in Braille, but if I was doing them in Braille, it'd be far better than English, because English is actually my second written language, which means I have very little knowledge of English, and with me being blind, it's very difficult to see that too. So I would love to know even why or how we're meant to be learning virtually, but with very little or no resources. Um, I'd also like to jump in on the, the poverty and education, but, um, I, um, I recently finished my, um, secondary education. I went back to school twice to get my A-levels because I came from a country that didn't do A-levels. Um, and as an asylum seeker, I was not entitled to funding for my A-levels which I had to then pay for myself, um, which if not many people know, asylum seekers and refugees aren't allowed to work. Um, and so we were never allowed to work for our money, but also we're only given 36 pound a week per person. Um, and then to pay 500 pounds annually for a subject to be able to get my education, which most students are entitled to, completely free was very difficult, um, as well as digital poverty as well. Um, I know loads of asylum seeker, asylum seeking families with young kids who can't afford technology, who can't afford Wi-Fi, who can't afford a lot of things that they need to be able to f uh, get their education. And 
And recently I read um, an article saying that the West, was it Westminster? The MPs in, in the mainland UK um, had been given Apple uh, products uh, free of charge by the government because they were working remotely from home. Um, and what I want to know is why would people who already earn so much need free of charge digital computers and stuff, which they probably already own to be re working remotely from home when there's people out there who have now resorted to donating their old digital items, their old laptops and having it then passed on to people who can't afford it. Why are we spending money on things that politicians don't really need that can go to people who really need it? Anyone else want to comment? He's happy. Carol, are you happy that we've covered all bases? I think I, I, I take your point about parity. Um, actually, I, do, I, I take it. But, and this was one of the things when I was introducing Jack there, uh, when we talked to young people about rights, a lot of them said to us, listen, Chris, I don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand this language. The consultation that went out, lots of them, lots of them couldn't complete it. It was just alien to them. And that's why we done our workshops and we tried to speak, talk them through it. And again, referring back to the work we've done with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, one of the big things that young people felt fed into that committee in 2015 and 16 was about knowledge of rights and uh, Natalie talked about that in her in her piece. I think the language of rights can be intimidating and when you don't know, when you don't know what rights you have, you know, what hope do you have of actually realising them? So that was, so I do take your point, Carol, about parity. But yeah. you know when your rights have been denied. Yeah. So if it doesn't feel right in your stomach, yeah, it's not right. So, so but listen, Carol, go us and um, Eridus August Jesperat and, you know, like Torar Dave. So thanks very much for your presentation. It's been brilliant. And just look after yourselves. For a moment. Come over, Carol. Okay, we're going to go now to Paula and Christopher has indicated as well. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for your presentation today. I suppose um, what my takeaway, I think, from today will be that, um, you know, children are not just a homogenous group in that, you know, there's obviously a lot of other issues like minority language rights, um, sexual orientation, ethnic, minor, or ethnic background, access to health care, uh, access to education. I suppose there's so, so many asset um aspects to this. Um, but my, my first question, I'm not sure who wants to take it, is really about what we are trying to do here as a as an ad hoc committee. And that is really to um, look at a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland that um, gives rise or gives um, cognizance to the particular circumstances here in Northern Ireland. Um, and so I just wondered if anybody could speak to, to how the legacy of the Troubles is impacting on them today. Really good question. I, I can I can make a stab, but I wanna I wanna ask others. Natalie, Naomi, Sayira, Kira, Jack. And um, so the question is about the legacy, of the past. So we talk about the troubles. We talk about the conflict, um, or whatever language you want to put on it. Can you talk about your own lived experience of living in that? Um, or would you like would you like me to go first? I, I don't mind. If one of you want to chat, just stick your hand up. No, I'm not seeing anyone. <laughs> Sorry, I should have been clear. I'm not asking anybody to divulge any um, personal circumstances. It's more just even just how it still manifests itself in school and youth clubs and sports clubs. You know, is there sort of almost like a hangover from the troubles and how it's still impacting on their lives today? Yeah, I'll speak a little bit. and It might give the others a chance to think. We're, we're doing a piece of research right now, Paula, um, asking young people their views on the centenary of the establishment of Northern Ireland, okay? So, and, and again, even the language we use around that can be divisive, right? And so we're asking young people, well, look, what do you think about this? Um, questions around border polls, constitutions, the troubles, how much they think about the troubles, how much they learn about the troubles, what they even, what language they use. Um, and I think, although we're still in the midst of conducting that research, what we're hearing back is a real mixed bag. 
um, and overwhelmingly, when I talk to people on the ground, they talk a lot about young people being concerned about issues like what we've talked about today, poverty, exclusion, mental health, education. Um, but we do talk a lot to young people about um, linking linking the legacy of the past to their contemporary lives. So I suppose that's a fancy way of, of saying how has the past affected you and how does it still affect you? And I guess as a as a practitioner in this field, I have no doubt that it, it most definitely does. Um, but like when I was answering Mike's question about age GFAs, I think sometimes it's accepted. It's, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a degree of apathy, you know, that that's just the way it is here. That's just the way it is. And we just get on with it. Um, but I have no doubt that in my, my professional opinion would be that the, you know, many of the issues that young people face in Belfast are similar to those in Dublin, London, Liverpool, Manchester, Paris, Glasgow, but the 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 legacy of um, the conflict, the past, whatever, definitely magnifies those issues, in my opinion. Um, and we can look at mental health as an example of um, many people believe that um, our mental health issues and the, the, the higher numbers of mental ill health and, and suicide can, can be perhaps attributed um, to that. But I, I think, again, this is my opinion, so please... Jumped in, uh, young people. Um, I do definitely think that there is a special case. There's a special case for Northern Ireland, North of Ireland. Again, all this language that we use um, for um, additional rights protections. And I know that in Wales and Scotland, there's some good working on there in terms of embedding um, the UNCRC and the domestic law. I, I'm not sure that they've done it yet in Scotland, but I know that they were going to. But I think, given our unique circumstances, we should be miles ahead. We, Scotland should be looking at us, actually, and saying, well, look, they're doing it there. So I suppose to answer your question, from my perspective, I think that young people need more protection because of our particular past. But look, that's that's just my opinion. Natalie, Sayira, Kira, Jack, would you just like to comment? I, I come in briefly if that's okay. Um, something that young people we work with talk about is transgenerational trauma and how that has impacted them through with their parents and the issues, whether it's pure mental health, addiction issues, whatever. So we're in transgenerational trauma that we have here um, in Northern Ireland. Um, the survey that we've recently put out that Chris was talking about there indicated that around young people wanting to move away from stereotypes from the past and young people coming through as identifying as non-religious and not necessarily green or orange. That's coming through um, in the survey with the young people we're working with. I have a second question if people want to have a think about that. I suppose my second question and I think you touched on it there a second, Chris there about you know how we can even go further than other parts um, of the UK and Ireland and, and the rest of the world. And that's about sort of the emerging narrative around environmental rights, um, you know, a lot of people talk about socioeconomic or civil and political, but I'm just wondering to what degree is it important to the young people on this call and you work with that we are actually very cognizant of climate change and protecting the planet for future generations. So I'm just wondering, is that something you'd like to see in a Bill of Rights? Yeah, most definitely, Paula. Do you know what? Before before COVID hit us, that was probably one of the biggest issues that we were grappling with. Uh, and you can remember the Youth Strike for Climate movement and Natalie facilitated a group. She worked really closely with a group of young activists. And I have to say, wow, the, the, the young people educated us. They were absolutely amazing. And they talked a lot about um System change wasn't that the wasn't that the call? System change, not climate change. And I think some of the young people here were probably involved in that movement. Uh, I'm not sure if Naomi's dropped out, but I know she was definitely involved. I was at one of the rallies with her. Um, but most definitely, this is uh, absolutely huge. Natalie, I don't know if you or Kira were you involved in that group. If any of you want to come in and, and just talk a little bit about the rights, you know, because as I say, Natalie, that, that group of young people blew me away. Um, you know, we our job here is to support young people to further, like, social justice issues. And they, yeah. they, they were amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, as Chris said there, um, Kira as well was in that group. I'll let you come in in a minute. Um, Kira, but environmental issues was huge for young people coming through, and it came through 
on the recent Our Voices survey there. Um, last year, I worked with the group of young people in terms of social action around environmental issues. Um, and also they fed into the first consultation by Dara, And that was something that this book, the group spoke heavily about in terms of the importance of young people having a voice around um, decisions that affect their future. So in terms of the bridge between young people and government and feeding into policies, it's so important for young people to have a voice to talk about the, the issues that affect their lives. Kira, do you want to talk a wee bit around your experience in the environmental subgroup? Um, yeah, when we went, because I went to that rally as well, it was in September, at the end of September, I think, like, um, not September, but the September passed before that. Um, it was actually such, it was so good to see the turnout, but even um, all the meetings and like just when we all got together before, it was so good to see because I even, I thought I was like educated more than I was with it. And it's so good to see everyone and like everyone's so passionate about it, but everyone likes to talk um, about how coronavirus is such a bad thing. But like, that's one thing that was so like positively impacted was the environment, um, which I love to see that, but still not enough. Like everything was going back the, the way it was. And because we can't even um, in the form, we can't meet up really anymore. So it's hard to get our meetings back and actually start making progress on when we want to meet with like other political leaders to discuss this further and try and get it, especially into legislation. But it should definitely be um, in a Bill of Rights um, because I just think it's so important. But um, as well, um, it's not really related, but it, can, it obviously is. But um, there's no point in this Bill of Rights at all if this isn't taught at schools. Like, um, because I, I know I, I don't remember being taught about rights. I really don't remember being taught about rights. Maybe that was just me not paying attention and just messing with school, but I really don't remember being taught rights at all. And that's something that's really, really important that every single person knows their rights um, in primary school and then in secondary school as well, just as a refresher. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Deborah. Good. Thanks, Paula. Oh, sorry, Chris, were you going to come in there? I was going to bring Chris to you. Yeah, I was just going to add, I was just going to note um, that actually in the UN committee's list of issues, which you referred to earlier, the reduction of air pollution um, has been referenced uh, in relation to children's health. So again, you could argue about the right to life. I know here air pollution and water pollution is particularly bad. Children are growing up in inner city areas and um, and I think it goes on unspoke of, but just to note to the committee that that is an issue that the UK government will be asked about uh, by the UN committee. Yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Thanks. Christopher Stalford, I think you were looking in. Uh, yes, can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah, good, excellent. Um, firstly, thank you uh, for your, your presentation. Um, lots really interesting there. Um, just in terms of um, Naomi's experience, I'm, I'm the father of four children. I'm going through the statementing process uh, with one of them presently. And I understand uh, how difficult that is, but I, I'd be blunt, I think it's scandalous that if your uh, classroom assistant isn't there, you don't get a day of education. I just think that that's, that's outrageous. And I think that um, certainly, um, and I'd be taking that up as a department because that should not be the case um, for, for any child uh, or, or young person. So I, I, I think also in terms of one of the other contributors, I can't remember who, well, I think it might have been Kira, um, in terms of the, the way in which COVID has played out. In a very real sense, people's right to an education has been trashed by the COVID um, situation. And again, uh, I speak from personal experience. My eldest child is nine, P, she's in P6. P6 was a very, very important year. My daughter's lost that year. Um, and my son's in P5, my other son's in P3, and then we have a, a girl that's just turned three in the house. You can imagine what it's like trying with remote devices and what have you to make sure everyone gets the education that they're missing out on. So I do agree that going forward, I think the right to education should be an absolute right uh, and, and, and that should be uh, legally enforceable. 
put it like if you come on to the statementing process, anyone that's provided with a stage four statement, that is a legal requirement then placed upon the department in terms of their special educational needs and provision. That's legally enforceable. If it's not provided, parents should have recourse to the law uh, to ensure that it is enforced. Given that that is the situation that exists presently, what would a Bill of Rights add to that situation? So if I jump in here, so I'm going to speak from personal experience. I was a level five statement, so I required quite a good bit of care, more than a normal child, but still able to attend a mainstream school. We were told when we brought it up, or my father brought it up to them about me not having the right access to car. They'd be like, oh, but it's sort of, but the amount of fighting and meetings with the education authority my parents have had over the last load of years would scar a normal person. I think if the UNCRC was in place, the, the right, if I have specialist, if I have a disability and require specialist car needs, these must be met. Then that's also legally binding as well to the school that they can't go, well, Naomi, if I didn't show up, so you have to go home now. They would legally not be allowed to do that at all because then there's two, they're breaking actually two laws in one go. Well, there seems to be a loophole at the minute. I know you said that the statement is legally enforceable, but there seems to be a loophole within the education authority that they're able to go, well, if the school doesn't have it, then they don't have to enforce it if they're able to give legal reason. Mm. Yes. So there's, there's always a loophole where the UNCRC would then shut that loophole completely. Yes. Okay. So it's about basically uh, in terms of beefing up the legal enforceability of um, the right to education. Okay. Um, one one issue that was raised in terms of um, communication is, is Braille. And obviously there's a commitment in New Decade, New Approach, and I have a question in um, to the Minister uh, for Communities on this. There is a commitment in New Decade, New Approach to see the introduction of specific sign language legislation um, a sign language act, effectively. Um, so, again, that's that's a commitment that, that the government has determined. Oh, sorry, there's a bit of interference on that. Maya, can you hear me okay now? Sorry. Um, there's a, a commitment in New Decade, New Approach, uh, to see domestic legislation introduced in Northern Ireland uh, in relation to sign language provision. So again, I, I'm just saying that, you know, the government is committed to tackling uh, these issues, I suppose, independent of this process, if you see what I'm saying. So uh, I just wanted to, to put that on record. And um, one other issue which hasn't been raised, and it's really important, I think most people would accept that over the last 40 or 50 years, young people in care have been completely failed um, by the system. I'm just wondering what your view is on how we, we can improve, either through this mechanism or through other mechanisms, how we can improve the experience of young people in care. Well, young people in care have what's called key workers. And therefore, their key workers, there's a key worker per child. So each child will have a key worker within that setting. I think it's not that the key worker sort of takes on paperwork and it's sort of the in-between between between the social worker and that young person. I think the key worker, they have sessions. I know because I have a, I'm in support at Living, so it's sort of similar. It's ran by the health and social care system that you have a meeting with them once a week. Then should they not be teaching or letting that child know that there is laws that protect them? Like, once you age out of foster care at 16, you're expected to just live on your own, but you have no preparation to live on your own. From I work with a couple of young people that are in care, and I can tell you there's no preparation. Once they turn 16, it is more or less bye-bye, see you later, and we're out the door. Yeah. Regardless if that child has a disability or has any other additional need or is neurotypical, they will be told, 16, you're out. Okay. So that's, but, that's... Was, but then this law protects you, you're 25. So if you're a young person, you're 25, why are you kicked out of court 16? There seems to be a big gap there, which I've never really understood. I suspect that's probably budgets. Yeah, probably but, but that's that. lack of funding. Yeah. 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 Could, I, could I add just to Naomi points that I think your, your questions are really good ones. Um, they're actually, yeah, they're quite thought-provoking on, on the special educational needs one. Um, first of all, um, I think... 
again, a lived experience of my own. Sat as a board, sat as a governor uh, in a school for over a decade, um, and I can remember at times being um, it was like a, it was like a battle a day, um, trying to get children. Um, the most basic of uh, even equipment. I remember, I remember battling for months on end to get a, a special kind of seat for a child with special educational needs. Um, and I remember that, that that process was really for the parents and for the child, really quite daunting. Um, and there are lessons that we can learn. Um, there's, if we look at Finland, and I can't say I'm an expert, but I did read recently in Finland, the statement and process is different from ours. So it looks at it's more so based on the parent-teacher relationship. So you know your children, I know my children. The, the teacher knows the children, um, and you you will know if your child needs um, additional support in school. Um, often, I think the variable, the, from my own experience, the variable with special educational needs and statements are that from area to area, it can be a massive difference. So if you live in Belfast versus if you live in Antrim. Um, it could be night and day with regards to the support you get. It could depend on the person that you deal with. Um, you might get a very helpful person or a, a not so helpful person. So there's all this bureaucracy tends to get in the way. And again, if you look back at the Finnish model, I think I just read there, I was trying to look while you were talking there, what I read was something like 30% of children in Finland receive um, special educational needs support. Now, I don't know what the data is for here, but to me that sounds quite large. You know, so that would be a third of children in a classroom receiving special educational support. From my own children's experience, I would imagine that there's maybe one or two classroom assistants at a time. And I don't know if that those statistics might marry up, but I think that would be, for me, uh, the, leg the, the, the litigation, the legislative approach would um, enhance enhance the rights you know it, it would take away some of those variables for me i think as a as a governor or as a parent trying to get that support um, just, on that, just, just on that i think this this thing cuts to the central problem um northern ireland block grant subvention is about i mean this this area probably we probably generate about 10 billion a year and we receive a subsidy from westminster about 12 billion a year ultimately um, when it comes to government, you're talking about the allocation of resources. And if you place uh, particular legal obligations upon government, but you don't have the resources to match the obligations, that then raises questions about the allocation of resources. And that's where I think um, I'd just be keen to hear on that in terms of, I think it's important that there are certain things that are absolutely in, in, inviolable, right? So, I mean, I, I personally believe that the, you know, the right to life is an inviolable right. The right to an education is an inviolable right. I suppose the question is, in terms of going about codifying what we define as inviolable rights, how do we square that with the, responsibility, the, the basic responsibility of government, which is to allocate the resources that we have in a responsible way and to balance the budgets that are allocated to us? Yeah, look, please, Jack, Kira, Sayira, Naomi, jump in here as well. Uh, it's funny, I was writing a wee blog for the National Lottery about this today, actually, and the, the blog was about um, how we rebuild communities after COVID-19. Mm. And I think my experience of rebuilding is that people in our sector, you know, it's going to happen. We're going to rebuild, we're going we're gonna to get together and we're going to make a success of things. But I think it can't go back to the way it was. I think, you know, the system has been broken for, for a while and that's why you have a lot of these issues. But I guess what my what my narrative and it's only a it's an opinion piece, you know, it's not the youth forum piece or anything like that. But I guess my narrative was that um, bureaucracy and funding should never should never get in the way. And I think it is often used as a as a barrier, rightly or wrongly, you know, when you think about I think about my dealings with um, public servants, and don't get me wrong, there are many, many amazing public servants out there that are doing the same thing as what we're trying to do. But sometimes um, economics and bureaucracy are used as a as an excuse not to act. Um, and I think it's, it's like the, I mean, we have campaigned for years for a youth assembly. 
and it's great to see that that's going to happen now. There's the wheels are in motion for the youth assembly to happen. But our argument with that is that it should be legislated for because if if there's an economic downturn or if there's a, a change of appetite within the Solomon executive, well then all of a sudden that, that's dependent. But I think if, if things are set in law, um, it, it's better. It's better for our people that that those rights can be can be um, realised. I'm trying to remember your your third question. Your second one was about real. The third question I had an answer to, but I've forgotten what it was. If you would just remind me. I, mean, I think the, Braille was the second one. I think you answered the third one in terms of allocation of resources. Okay. I think, I think ultimately that's that's where um, I don't say I wouldn't call it a dispute, but that's where I think there is a a discussion to be had by the members of this committee, um, and I think it is around trying to square that circle vis-a-vis it will be well and good for elected members here to say you know x y and z are absolute rights but without the resources you can't do anything on that and it simply becomes a statement and i think it's about trying to um Govern responsibly. I mean, government is the allocation of resources by trying to govern responsibly uh, rather than simply producing a, a wish list that can't be delivered for people. I think that's that's where I think it's really important that we get it right. So, um, no, thank you very much. You, you've answered all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no other members have indicated. So, unless anyone else is looking to ask another question i think we can let you take your ease at this stage and thank you very much again for uh joining us this afternoon and for your presentation and your lengthy answering of questions um we we put you through your paces there so thanks very much we'll let you drop off the call now thanks for joining us emma thank you and just again the stress that uh, there, were, there were some pre-presentation nerves before the meeting but i think you'll agree with me that jack kira's here and, and naomi all done fantastic so well done, use for. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Can everyone hear right? We're bringing you back into the spotlight, Brilliant. Okay, so I know that um, I had been um yeah it's still on sorry it keeps showing me as frozen i'm not sure if, if you can hear me or not um the clerk had been suggesting to me there that we make rights to the the members of the youth forum individually to thank them for their contributions this afternoon they're very young and and they're they done brilliantly so if members are agreed we can do that brilliant i can see nodding heads there if we can for carl go right can i just make a wee suggestion that given care's first language is irish and that Naomi's first language is Braille, that we make a, a, a wee concerted effort to write them in their first languages, please. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate, actually. Can we do that, Clerk? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly, sure. Brilliant. Okay, so members, we've now got a presentation from Monica McWilliams. Um, so I think we can bring Monica into the spotlight. Monica, how are you? Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and for being so patient. Um, members, you'll find in your committee packs from page 46, you've got um, Monica's submission to her call for evidence, and she also presented us with a PowerPoint presentation that I believe she's going to speak to, which we received in table papers yesterday, or perhaps the day before. So, um, Monica, without further ado, I will um, let you begin your presentation. You don't need any introduction to anybody involved in the field of, of human rights and a Bill of Rights to the North. So, thank you very much for joining us. And Right. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Chairperson. I'm just going to call this up and you can let me know if you see it and if it's all on board. Can you hear me? Can you see this? We can. Yes, Brilliant. thank you. Okay, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, and it's because I'm interested in hearing your questions in relation to it. Um, I have already sent you the written brief on this, Chair, and 
members will have this in their pack. Basically, um, bills of rights can take different forms, as you've heard in your previous evidence, which I've read from Canada and South Africa um, and other places. And in particular, we wanted to look at those countries within the Commonwealth and with a parliamentary system. Um, but we took a lot of uh, time to consider our um, proposals. So they can be part of a constitution. They can also be part of a transitional justice mechanism after a conflict. And there are often many measures. And probably that was the reason why some attention was paid to it during the multi-party negotiations leading up to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And indeed, in many of the declarations and agreements thereafter, the rights can be judiciable or equally progressively realised. And I've set out some context and you can read that. But isn't it incredible to think that it's nearly 60 years since the first um, debate took place in the very place where you're sitting or would be sitting if it wasn't for COVID? Both Sheila Murnahan's proposal as a Liberal MP way back in 1966. And ever since then, it has remained on the floor of Stormont and indeed in the UK and in every round of negotiations from the 73 Northern Ireland Constitution Act onwards um, and right through to the 1998 agreement um, and consequently to the St Andrews Agreement. You're fairly familiar with this. We were asked to consult and advise. Um, the legislation was to take place in Westminster because it is a reserved matter. The rights were to be supplementary, as indeed I point out in my brief to you, the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights had already proposed that long before the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission came into existence. You have been focusing on the particular circumstances, but the one issue I draw your attention to was this issue of the international instruments. And I went back and got out all the papers leading up to the final Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And between the Monday and the Friday, um, that sentence had been added, drawing as appropriate on international instruments and experience. And I've been reading your prior evidence, and I would just like to draw your attention to the fact that anyone that refers to bells and whistles or to all singing, all dancing, really does not understand the context of these international instruments. Uh, and I think it's quite a derogatory way to refer to international human rights in that way, and it would have been very remiss of us as a Human Rights Commission with an accredited A status, which took me some time to get, by the way, once we were established by the UN at an A status level. And it was because we are set up under Westminster that we managed to get that accreditation and because our work was accredited as being of A status. So had we not taken on board those international standards, uh, we could have been criticised um, by the UN, but also we would have been letting people down in not adhering to those standards that we had been handed. So most of the focus has been on the particular context of Northern Ireland, particular circumstances, and much less, as you've just heard in that previous discussion from the Youth Forum, on the international standards, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, for instance, or even on standards to do with disability that you've just been speaking about which weren't considered when the Universal um, Declaration was drawn up in 48, because they only thought of disability in terms of war veterans, and they didn't think of disability in terms of learning and physical disabilities. Um, and so rights are dynamic and they do change, and that's probably important, but it's very important to look at what those international standards say so that we don't deviate, because there can be unintentional consequences when you pay attention just to the particular circumstances. And then the task was to take into account in the mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem. Very difficult concept, actually. Um, and taken together with the European Convention, and I think that's really important that those words were in our mandate, taken together with the European Convention. Um, because as you've seen, some of the arguments have been over whether or not we had just been mandated to scope out and once we'd scoped that that was sufficient. And indeed, in different parts of the agreement and in our mandate, you will see that the assumption had been that the European Convention would be incorporated into domestic law through the Human Rights Act, but also be supplemented. And it was the supplementary rights that were to form the Bill of Rights. 
So I don't understand in previous evidence that you've been given that there was never really an obligation on the government uh, when in fact it was there in the agreement. Um, so the clear formulation not to be discriminated was a very difficult one. Um, given that the laws on equality had uh, had advanced and indeed have advanced since. And so again, a criticism perhaps was that we were so inclusive. But the words such as are very important because as you have also come to realise that since we presented that advice in 2008, there are indeed other rights issues that have come to the fore. But I'd just like to make the point in relation to the what I just heard earlier was that it was quite forward thinking of the Commission at the time to include issues like environmental rights. Think of 2008 and 13 years later where we are on that issue in terms of climate change. Um, and the European Union, for instance, just yesterday passed a law on environmental rights in relation to businesses and exploitation. Um, and third countries, which the UK is now, have an exit at the um, European Union um, and regard it as a third country, will have to abide by the law that it will pass in June, which is in relation to how businesses are exploiting the environment and people's rights, indigenous people's rights in particular in other parts of the world, but also in terms of how pollution has become an issue. I just throw that in because I've been listening to the earlier debate. Anyway, we started the consultation by the previous commission under Bryce Dixon in 2000. It was regarded as one of the biggest public participation exercises ever taken on in Northern Ireland. And I think people are disappointed that their expectations were raised to such an extent that something was going to happen. And indeed, I was the person who was asked by the two governments after the 98 agreement when I was first an assembly member to address this issue. Um, and I brought parties together around the table in uh, Parliament buildings at Stormont to discuss a way forward in conjunction with the Human Rights Commission's consultation. And I noted that... Um, Christopher Stalford, Christopher, you made a comment that you had to sit in the Bill of Rights Forum, and I think, Holly, you've also sat on it, and Carl, perhaps, um, and I'm aware because I gave evidence to that forum or testimony at the time on behalf of the Commission. Um, it was me who first promoted that idea uh, as chair of that committee that was established by the Irish and British governments to find a way forward, including the political parties, because most of the consultation at the time was taking place with civic society. And I promoted the idea to have a roundtable forum, uh, which did sit uh, for two years and was chaired by Chris Sadoti, um, an international human rights expert and the chief commissioner of the Australian uh, Commission. And so it was important that we had someone of that status. But when the forum presented its report to me, there were a number of options and it hadn't agreed a framework. But the commission itself set itself the task between uh, the time it was handed the report, I think in, in May, and it was nine months later, almost the time of gestation, in terms of giving birth to someone, that I set a date for the 10th of December, a very, very tough deadline. And the commission worked extremely hard, 54 meetings, seven weekends. And I would suggest perhaps that you might want to leave yourselves some serious dedicated time to uh, deliberate on what you've heard to date. Um, because that's the most difficult part. And finally, we presented the evidence on International Human Rights Day um, to the Secretary of State. Um, British government changed to a Conservative Party government, well, coalition government, and that changed everything because Prime Minister Cameron came to Ballymena and said there would be a British Bill of Rights and not a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, and there would be a chapter in it. And that led to all kinds of confusion in the UK Commission that sat to deliberate on that, actually said that the Northern Ireland process was a separate one. And the other commissions that were established after us in Scotland and in GB and um, actually argued the same thing. So we were like-minded, as was the Joint Com Committee on Human Rights. But once that decision was taken to devolve it and to reach consensus, which I had not been asked to do, because it's not a party political thing that I produced or my commissioners, and I pay huge tribute to the commissioners. And I would like to put it on record that the process on the last day when we signed off on the final uh, proposals, I asked each of the commissioners, did they believe the process had integrity? And they said it did. Um, and that had I acted in best interests of all the commissioners, and they agreed. 
And you may see that to dissent it from the final um, proposals, and they had every right to do so. But we did not in our statutory orders um, and the standing orders as we were established um, have uh, the ability to give anyone a minority report. And I think that was probably because the previous Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights had a provision for that, but we did not. Um, in fact, I never saw a minority report. That's probably important to say that as well. I did see some evidence given later to the UK Commission, but I had never been presented, nor indeed had any of the commissioners. But eight out of ten of us stood on the 10th of December and presented what you now see on this page and which has been described as extensive, but in fact fits onto that one page. And I would add that most of the rights were enshrining protections that were already in existing legislation, um, and that's the difference between a Bill of Rights and existing legislation. And in fact, uh, we're giving effects only to some rights, not that many, which have been described as maximalist. And so that's really important that that's understood and come um, now to the end of this that those rights are already in the European Convention. Um, and so it perhaps looked much bigger, but it was very important for an educational point of view um, and for people to understand these are the rights you already have. So for anyone to suggest there wasn't a right, for instance, to parade, there is indeed a right of, to freedom of peaceful assembly and associations already there. The right of education is already there. In fact, the right to an effective education. Um, and so... It's very important to understand that those who wanted to focus on some of those rights um, may not have understood that those rights were already there. Um, but as you probably know, there's a difference between rights that are absolute and rights that are relative and that have to take into account um, the circumstances of public order, for instance, um, in relation to the right uh, to the freedom of association. So... Um, we set out that what we advised, it wasn't legislation, which again, I have seen people say that we produced a law. We did not. We produced advice. Um, and we argued that there were um, reasons why we and set out a very important methodology, which we tested ourselves by in terms of the advice that was set. Um, and it's in, in the appendix um, of our report and I would suggest that it's really important, perhaps, to look at criteria when it comes to these. And so those are the, these are the particular issues that we felt um, needed to be um, more protected, and particularly given our mandate, this right to equality and non-discrimination. I would add that we took um, expert evidence from the top lawyers who gave of their time, and their, append their names are in the appendix of the report, the very top people who had worked in human rights, some who were in the House of Lords, others who had their own legal companies, uh, and one, indeed, Sir Geoffrey Gile, who um, had advised on the UK's Bill of Rights to the, um, the countries on which the UK oversee, and I think the Human Rights Commission has already pointed that out to, to you. So that's important. These were the rights that we said could be progressively realised, and I do not want to spend much time on this because you have gone into this extensively in terms of this issue about whether it should be a directive, whether it should be progressively realised or whether it should be judiciable. And indeed, as in my time as Human Rights Commission, members of the Assembly wrote to me on some of these rights, um, and particularly the right to health. There is a parasitic, as it's known, parasitic um, right, Article 14. And I indeed took a case on that when Minister Majimsi was running the health department on the tamoxifen drug for cancer, which wasn't available in Northern Ireland. And we both agreed that we shouldn't have to go to court, um, that it was a postal code lottery, and that that uh, drug, that remission drug, which I actually later became a beneficiary of, um, unknown to me at the time that I would be, um, and it was introduced, and that women had the right then to access it. Um, so that's a very interesting point to make, I think, that it was under... Article 14, that we were able to bring that right under um, that particular right to life and, and tie it in with the Article 2 right. Um, and so then these are technical matters from which I understand you have taken some evidence from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and it's really important that these technical matters are taken into consideration. 
There was then a very inadequate consultation, a very disappointing consultation. If anything, probably we should have simply said, put our proposals out for consultation and let people have a look at those and respond accordingly. There's been a difference over the years in terms of the political parties. Um, on the union side, the Progressive Unionist Party have always been supportive ever from the days of John McMichael. Um, and likewise from the leadership of David Irvine when he was leading the Progressive Unionist Party and more recently. Um, Lions Party, Sinn Féin, SDLP have been consistent in relation to this. And more recently, the two unionist parties um, have also come on board. But in my time, that was very difficult to achieve. Um, and so I've already mentioned the differences of opinion between even the UK parties in relation to this Bill of Rights. The Human Rights Commissions have all stood together on this issue. You might want at some stage to have a look at the Charter of Rights, which we were also mandated, but it was a different proposal in the Good Friday Agreement. The two commissions, North and South, that are mandated to meet on a quarterly basis, produced this charter, and I gave it to the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly and to the Concordia in the... Uh, so they are sitting in libraries um, in both Stormont and in Dublin. Um, and probably may be looked at now, given the changes in circumstances. That last point's important um, in terms of alleviating any concerns about the equivalency of rights north and south. And that's, I understand, what um, the two commissions have been asked to do by the UK government um, and have been given some funding to do in relation to Brexit. Um, the Hasso Sullivan talks also asked that this be included and in every set of talks since, I think, have, including the New Decade, New Approach. Um, and so this last point I'd make too is that it's an educational issue. It's not just this notion of running to courts or that it's um, there to hold governments accountable. I think a culture of rights, particularly in a country coming out of conflict, is really important. And so when we begin speaking about a Bill of Rights or a constitutional right. And I say in my brief to you that perhaps the agreement could have been clear that rather than it being put there as a constitutional guarantee, it ended up being debated as some kind of aspiration, which did not help the notion that it could be a foundational document that protected the rights of all. And so instead of it being a pick and mix, um, I think you have a huge responsibility um, in terms of looking at what rights should be made available. I'd stop sharing now and hope that that has worked and that I'm back with you again. Um, is that the case? Am I back with you? You are in the Okay. Um, so um, the, I'd say at the end of this um, contribution, Chair, what my advice would be is that I haven't taken all this evidence and I've read all of it. Um, and I've looked at everything that you've been consulting on so far, that there were was 10 years of hard work put into that. And t things have changed since then, so you may want to look at some of the changes. But most importantly, I think you need to take as a committee time out for yourselves that when you have completed your evidence taking, you will need months to sit and deliberate by yourselves on these issues. And you may need the assistance, not may, you will need the assistance of those who have expertise in this area. And I have to say to you that we spent nine months of dedicated time outside of the consultation and it was time well spent. And we went away from headquarters and took ourselves off for weekends and sat down and went through everything that we'd heard, but also how to prepare that final document in a way that stood up um, both legally um, and that would be d deliberated on uh, by the parties in a way that they could understand. And that would be used as a culture of rights in terms of a culture in schools and education. And we produced a lot of tools thereafter. But I, it is a big task and I wish you well in your deliberations. But my biggest advice or piece of advice to you would be leave yourselves lots of time to do that work. Well, thank you very much. I want to ask you, I know you've, you've referred there to the fact that you've been watching a lot of the presentations that we've had, so you'll probably have 
noticed that I have asked a lot of our um, contributors around the idea of a Bill of Rights as an accountability mechanism. And I notice, I mean, for me, when I think of a Bill of Rights, I think of it in, in two respects, first and foremost, as something that sort of sets the tone for society and establishes, you know, almost in, in the sense of an aspirational guide for society, how we want to treat people. But then in the second regard, a, an accountability measure, something that's going to hold decision makers and governments to account. And I noticed that in your written presentation, and I hope I don't, I'm not misrepresenting you here, but you had referred to the fact that had a Bill of Rights earlier in the process been treated as something that could embed a culture of rights within society. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of understood from that that you were saying it was regrettable that that hadn't happened. I wondered what your view as a Bill of Rights and accountability measure was. It's incredible it didn't happen and in the agreement, if you read the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, you, you will see two things that did not happen. One, there was a proposal for the uh, Department of Equality and that was never established. Um, Ulster Unionist Party and SDLP led the executive at that time in the deliberations and um, before we got to Vols Powers, I was in that first assembly. Um, and so the Department of Equality wasn't established but the Standing Committee wasn't established either. Uh, which was to take papers, take evidence and review uh, decisions, uh, which would have been helpful had there been such a committee um, in terms of the legislation that um, Stormont passes. Because it came to me as Chief Commissioner to do the compliance and they also um, Northern Ireland Assembly has its own legislative advisor on this issue. Um, and so... I think it would have been enormously helpful had there been a committee, both in terms of the legislation that's passed in the Assembly, but also I would have had somewhere to go when I produced that advice and we could have deliberated on it in a committee rather than on the floor of the plenary, where sometimes the debates are not able to go into the detail, um, particularly if it's a legal document. And that's the reason why you have other committees at consideration stage and that deliberate some pieces of legislation and you take evidence and testimony. And that would have been an, made an enormous difference. And in the absence of that, and maybe because it was a reserved matter, and I also know it was because assembly members were so busy in those days that this fell off the table. Um, and the Patent Commission came through on policing and that took up a huge debate. And it was legislated and it was dealt with in a different way, the legislation went through Westminster. It was deliberated on at Westminster in the consideration stages. Amendments were made, proposals were made, and Northern Ireland parties all participated in that. Um, the Bill of Rights didn't get a space. And as soon as the decision was taken that it should go down to the floor of the Assembly, and the Sewell Convention also was important and kicked in in relation to the devolved administrations. And it was right that the Assembly um, that the UK took the mind of the Assembly on this issue. Um, but unfortunately, the veto and the cross-community uh, petition, which was never meant to be used in that way, meant that the Bill of Rights got pushed to one side and became such a contentious and hot potato. And rather than being seen as a protection of all the people in Northern Ireland, um, it ended up being seen as something that was divisive. Um, I don't think that would be the case now. I would hope that wouldn't be the case now. So it just shows you how much changes uh, given the passage of time. Thank you. Um, and, and I would agree with a lot of what you're saying. I know as well there you had referred to how even at that time conversations around environmental rights and things that are now much more in the public domain and, and things that we're talking about much more and how rights will change over time and priorities will change over time and I know we've had previous presentations who have, have pointed to you know the worth of a good bill of rights is that it will be broad enough that it will move and adapt with time and as things become as things change the bill of rights will will provide for that um so I know that one of the the key things out of Good Friday Agreement was the reference to the particular circumstances of the North and we've had many that would argue that the particular circumstances of the North in 1998 or 1968 are totally different to the particular circumstances of the North now and we have different sort of protected categories of people who are in a rights deficit or maybe more exposure to 
to the people that are, are in a rights deficit. Um, and I, I wondered what you would say around how, how a Bill of Rights should cover those individuals. Well, I think that's going to be your committee's responsibility um, in terms of the the new issues. I actually would say to you, Chair, that there weren't that many issues we didn't look at. It was a very forward-looking document. Everyone said we should have just looked at the past because of the conflicted nature of our society. But if you're worth your salt in terms of if you're going to be called a Human Rights Commission, you also needed to look to the future. And we did that to the best of our ability. Um, in terms of those environmental rights, um, there was a suggestion we should have only brought it in in particular circumstances because of the bombings of buildings and the destruction that happened as a result of 30 years of conflict. Um, and that's a good reason to consider it as a particular circumstance, but it wasn't the only reason, and hence the reason why we recommended it. But I would add, we were not political parties. We were commissioners, independent human rights commissioners. And therefore, we um, shouldn't have been tasked with looking at consensus. Sometimes, if you seek that so much, you may end up with the lowest common denominator, because you mightn't get very much consensus beyond a couple of rights. And so from that point of view, I think it's really important that you would look at the changes that have taken place from 2008 to 2022, which is the time that you will complete your final report. But you may find that there isn't that much more that you would add. And I'm very curious to see what you would. Thank you. You broke off a wee bit there at the end, but I think I was getting your point and, and I suppose to reiterate the point that I think you're making there is, is how good relations has sometimes taken precedence over equality. And I know from my own perspective, from our party's perspective, we wouldn't agree with that. Um, I'm going to pass now to Mike. Chair, can I say something on that? I don't think there should be a fight between those two. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Well, I've always, people argue about this very positive, positive notion of legalistic bills of rights and human rights. They're actually a conflict prevention tool. They're not just um, um, a, an accountability tool for government. It kind of tells people that this is a prevention. You might have wanted to do that, but and it goes back to um, Christopher Stalford's earlier question to the Youth Forum. That should not have happened to that young woman because had the decision maker taken human rights compliance into account, and oftentimes we do make decisions based on resources, but you must prove first before you'd make that decision that you're compliant in terms of human rights. This decision often about removing children from their mothers at birth because they did not believe that the mother was uh, able to care for her. Social workers can't do that anymore without doing a human rights assessment. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's actually, in terms of building good relationships, right relationships, and it puts down a framework. So they shouldn't be that incompatible in terms of, I understand the point you're making, which is one is judiciable and the other isn't. But I also don't think the committee needs to focus too much on this war of words between relationships um, and um, and court cases that uh, I would love for people to see the Bill of Rights as a, as a preventative mechanism that we will never, should never have the conflict ever again that we had if people actually got into their heads what a culture of rights means and that I respect your rights as much as you have the right and need to respect my rights. That's a pretty long-winded answer to that point, but I think it is your point about building the right relationships. Thanks, Monica. Actually, the, the point that I was getting at was around the fact, you know, it's my belief that rights are universal and that extending rights to any individual or group sh shouldn't and doesn't mean a lack of rights to anyone else. And I feel like the trap that we have fallen into in the past here and the problem that we've encountered is that certain people will have an issue with a particular rights issue and preventing political disharmony has led to those rights not being realised and it's the, the good relations versus equality argument that we sometimes fall into and that, that's what I was getting at but I, I totally take your point in terms of 
creating rights for everyone means that you don't have gaps in society and therefore you don't have those opportunities for conflict. Thank you. Mike. Chair, sure, thank you very much. And good afternoon, Monica. Good afternoon, Mike. Um, I'm very taken um, with your caution that we need to spend time uh, as a group because we, we have naturally uh, devoted the time so far to taking evidence. Um, but to rush into any kind of public forum, I think, would would be uh, an error. And, and I, say I welcome your your advice with that regard. In, in, in terms, just in terms of the history of it, Molly, and you've been very clear, I appreciate the, the kind of timelines. But I just want to ask you about the Human Rights Commission was asked to look at the scope. And there were two interpretations, weren't there? Those who said there is no scope and there is no, therefore no commitment in the agreement to actually bring forward a Bill of Rights. And those who said, well, there has to be some degree of scope. So was this part of the constructive ambiguity? I don't think so. I, I think that comes with an... Can you hear me? I'm getting yeah. something. Okay. It came with an interpretation. And um, the most honest answer would be it was a political interpretation. Because there were, over the years, those who no longer believed there should be a Bill of Rights. Um, that changed, because I was there during the... Forum for Dialogue and Understanding, um, when all the parties actually said they were for a Bill of Rights. Um, I think the issues that resulted, and Bryce Dixon changed his view from being the Chief Commissioner previously, where he actually produced advice on a Bill of Rights, to suggesting that scoping the Bill of Rights was sufficient, so scoping the advice. I actually think we're dancing on the head of a pin here. And um, I don't think the two governments ever, and then certainly in my discussions with them, interpret it as being, okay, you scope out the advice and that's sufficient. You've done your, you've fulfilled your mandate. And in any Secretary of State that I spoke to, and I think I've spoken to a dozen over the years, uh, wouldn't have interpreted it that way. Why would you um, put yourself to such an extensive um, amount of work, both in every round of negotiations that you've had, um, post the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Agreement, into the Hillsborough Direc Declaration of 2003, into St Andrew's Agreement, into um, Haas of Sullivan um, and, and yours, New Decade, New Approach, if you thought that a word scope would stand up. Why would political parties have given such amount of effort and time to putting it into every one of those that I've mentioned? had it not taken it as a serious issue and with a view that it should be legislated on. And Mike, I can't hear you. Oh, Hello? I can't. But yes, I can now. All right, OK. But, but, so back in 98, the 10 parties started, nine finished the negotiations. We're all nine accepting that there would be some form of Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. Eight parties finished. Um, two left. Um, did they all? Yes, they did. I was in the subcommittee, the confidence building subcommittee. Um, I think Ken McGuinness was the Ulster Unionist Party representative on that subcommittee. Um, Billy Mitchell was the Progressive Unionist Party, now deceased. Um, and the um, I could actually name every individual who was on it from all of the parties. Um, and I have all those minutes, which I can put at the disposal of the clerk, in terms of what would what would that proposal in the final agreement mean? Um, and particularly, we had a lot of discussion, and I see you have, on cultural rights, on economic and social rights. We deliberated in those two years prior to the 10th of April 1998 on, on each of those particular rights, not just on political and civil rights, but on all of the others, because some of them were contentious, and particularly cultural rights and language rights. Um, so there was quite a, a lot of discussion. It wasn't just that on the last week of, of the Belfast Agreement, Good Friday Agreement, that people just said, oh, let's have this proposal. A lot of thinking had gone in, and by the two governments, I have to say, as well. 
Um, I have my um, Easter reading. <laughs> I take it you wouldn't resile from any of this, but if anything, you would add to it. Um, well, things have changed. I have it here in front of me. Um, and some of the issues have changed. For instance, you have now legislated on the issue of civil partnership. Um, so time does um, bring a difference. The difference is, however, in a Bill of Rights that that's enshrined and it's much harder to um, make an amendment to a Bill of Rights than it is to a piece of legislation in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, but the answer would be that it's a very good template. And I have made the proposal to you that you, as a committee, take time out, bank what you agree in that template, um, and I assume that you'll bank what's already there in the Human Rights Act, unless you're very taken with the current review that's taken place um, at Westminster. Um, so bank what you agree. There will be areas that you will disagree and you will have to deliberate on those um, and move to the most problematic ones where you have complete disagreement. And that will take you some considerable time. But do it like I would say to my students when they're doing an exam. Sit down and read over your essay and then see how much of it applies to the question on the paper. The, the other uh, area that you've touched on, which would strike a chord with me is today, is the need to, to educate people. And, and I go to the foreword from your, from your report, where you say, if a Bill of Rights is to underpin peace, it needs to be embedded in attitudes and mindsets. It should not only influence the thinking and action of those in power, but instill in each person a confidence in asserting and securing their own rights. So actually, to meet the challenge of, of this committee agreeing a Bill of Rights, is, uh, to use a football analogy, it's half time. And the second half has to be to educate people uh, as to what this Bill of Rights is and what it means and how they should access it and use it. Um, I would say that you're much further down the road than half. If you're doing a, I used to be an athlete. And if you were going around the track, um, I'd say that, you know, we have put a lot of work. The schools are way ahead of us here in terms of the education and it's age appropriate. I've been to the primary schools um, and the, the curriculum in the secondary schools that deals with um, personal development is actually using um, the Human Rights Act. Um, and the Human Rights Commission did a huge educational job on the assembly in terms of all the civil servants and all the departments. Um, and you know the judiciary, 30,000 magistrates and 3,500 judges had to put themselves through that education. But you're absolutely right. And can I say to you, this is complex. This is complicated stuff. And there can be unintended consequences of people thinking, I have this right, um, and therefore I should have it, when actually you need to read across to see what the implications would be on another right. Um, and so those are the discussions, I think, that is really useful in terms of our education. Maybe it's our generation at least understood this because the convention was only incorporated into domestic law in the year 2000. Um, so we're talking about Generation X and the Z, as they now call themselves. Um, and, you know, there's a really good, important point there about duties and rights. And the government does have a duty. It has a statutory duty. What's the difference between having a statutory duty and having something in a foundation document or a constitutional document? Interesting as ever, Monica. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. I want to bring Carl in now. Hi, Monica. Um, as always, very, not only very interesting, but um, obviously very topical today. Um, we've all, you know, well, I've certainly used the 2008 document almost as the spine to compare it with everything else, because even even the presentation from the youngsters earlier, like I, I'm, I'm not patronising them at all, but the fact that they're you know you know re researching their rights and comparing it to where the fee.
hide something or something isn't fair is just refreshing. But the issue I have is, and I think I know the, the answer, is that unless you have a Bill of Rights and Trent legislation, then it's going to be an aspirational document. And then the, just to explain the point, because I, I have used it a lot in this committee, and this is the reason why I'm explaining it. So, for example, in North Belfast, homes weren't built for people in need because it may impact on good relations. So that's why I keep talking about equality having primacy over good relations. So there was a so there was a statement from a statutory body saying we cannot build homes in North Belfast unless there's community consensus. And for me, that's wrong. And that was three years ago. So it, it wasn't like decades ago. It was three years ago. And ironically, one of those families is still in a hostel waiting on a home. So that's why... I would be very specific about using that example of equality having primacy over good relations. Um, I don't undermine or dilute good relations at all. Absolutely not. But when someone's rights have been deliberately denied, we need to use a strategy application to make sure it's about need, not creed. So it is about um, ensuring that the Bill of Rights is in legislation. And some of those issues that you all discussing 1998 um, are still have not been legislated for in 2021. So I suppose, you know, in addition to what was already there, what else is it you think that we need to do? Um, and I do appreciate you saying we need to take time because I'm like Mike, I'm, I think, think we're taking a lot of evidence, but the consideration of that and what we do with it is going to be the biggest challenge for us, in my opinion. So it's just over to yourself, Monica. It is about legislate, legislating for our rights. And certainly um, I'm nervous about the review of the Human Rights Act because reviews, when I hear someone reviewing an act, it's to, I don't feel that it's about making it stronger. I feel it's about stripping stuff out and uh, that's why I think this process is so, so important. Um, yeah, let me start with that last point. I've been through the UK government give evidence to the Joint Committee on numerous occasions when they did previous reviews and they'd gotten over um, because they couldn't make it any better. Um, and some of the issues that the that you need to look at in terms of additions may be to do with the protocols to the European Convention that weren't incorporated into law. None of those is the freedom of movement. Um, and But again, you're a devolved assembly, so that may be something that you would have to deal with very carefully. Um, and I say that also because of the context of Brexit. Um, the others that you would have to look at are the removal of the, fund the charter and fundamental... Um, social and economic rights, which was in existence, so we didn't have to worry too much because it was there and it was part of European law. It's not now, so you may want to look at that. I think you've already taken enough evidence on that issue in relation to the judges being able to make a good decision about what falls to the executive and what falls to the courts. Um, and so some of that may come up. You may, you might, and I was listening to the young woman earlier, in relation to the asylum seeker, but that's a, that's a very difficult issue in terms of asylum seekers and refugees. I've, in my time I, afterwards, I did a lot of work on domestic violence um, and particularly in, in terms of asylum seekers and their rights, because you do not, you know, there's an absolute right not to be subjected to inhumane treatment, which is whether it doesn't matter if you're an asylum seeker, refugee or a uh, a national or a resident, those are universal rights. So, but my point to the young woman earlier um, would have been that there's an issue about the right not to be destitute. Um, and that's, there's court case law um, on that issue in terms of uh, asylum seekers. Um, the issue of the equivalency of rights, I think that's really important between the North and South. Um, and I think the Republic of Ireland has a lot of work to do on that issue. I've often raised the issue of the coroner's courts being so different in terms of the investigation to the right to life. 
um, where it is an unnatural death. Um, and just let me make the point that it's local doctors in the south of Ireland who are the coroners. And here we have the highest standards of judicial decision making now in the coroners courts. So there are issues there in relation to equivalency of rights that may not have been just quite to the fore in 2008 um, as they would be now. Um, but there are, I, I went through all of this before um, giving this evidence today to see what, what has changed. And I think that, that issue of children's rights is certainly coming up much more than it did. And it, it did in 2008 because we had very active civil so sector people, the Children's Law Centre um, and the children's sector um, were very strong advocates. Um, but we had just almost brought in the legislation on the best interests of the child. That's gone much further now. And there's much more human rights compliance decision making in relation to children under 18. And we made some points about detention and about um, fair trials in relation to children. So all of that comes up. Um, and disability is also a further issue that you might want to look at. But all of it's there. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not, it's good to know that we're not doing too bad. We're not too far. The mark, the issue for me is obviously it's about mindsets and awareness. So that young girl, Naomi, had her school been aware of her human rights, then she would not have been sent home because a classroom assistant wasn't there. You know, and that, that's the issue. Carol, it goes back to your earlier point about its statutory authority. Mm -hmm. They do have obligations under yeah. the Human Rights Act, and they're, they're called positive obligations mm -hmm. and also due diligence. And those are the two that have um, I work with mostly in relation to human rights of victims of domestic violence and sexual abuse. Was the positive obligation paid attention to? Did the police have due diligence? when it made this decision or that decision. They cannot mm -hmm. protect everybody. Yeah. In cases of femicide and homicide, we know that. But if they were alerted to it in advance, what did they do? Yeah. And those are the real... And the same with the housing executive. Yeah. What due diligence did you pay before you made that decision? How compliant yeah. was it with human rights? You have an, a positive obligation to those who are the most deprived or disadvantaged. Did you take that into account? when you were making that final decision. Yeah, I know. Well, the answer to the latter is no. But anyway, Monica, it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we can now go to Paula. I don't think any other members have indicated, so if any of the rest of you are looking in, just jump in at any time. Paula, go away, sorry. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank, uh, thank you, Monica, for coming today. It's been really, really interesting. I suppose every one of these sessions almost more solidifies in my own head about what, what we need to be doing around this. Um, and I was just going to ask you about the um, how a Bill of Rights could be used uh, as a pre-legislative scrutiny tool in terms of making sure that whether it's an executive bill or a private member's bill or even a strategy, how this can you know, really help us sort of define whether or not we're human rights compliant. Of course it would, because then it's a piece of legislation that you have to take into account the same way as you take into account at the minute the convention rights through the Human Rights Act. Um, and at the minute, as I said earlier, it, all of that passes through the Human Rights Commission and it does a due, due diligence for you along with your lawyer in Parliament building. Um, but I think it would be the Assembly members would be much more au fait um, with every stage of your private member's bill or your executive bill, if there was a Bill of Rights, because it sits alongside that. It can't be in contravention to it. Um, and I think it would be great for Northern Ireland for all of the reasons of our past. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I suppose I'm picking up on your point there around the, the UN, like the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Rights of People with Disabilities and stuff, those sort of international human rights standards, that, that could, they could be brought into... Um, domestic law and then you know where we maybe can't rely on them at the minute because they're a duty on the UK government well Paula I think you need to look at that very carefully and here's a question you need to ask yourself would your committee's intention be to bring all of those international conventions and simply read them across into domestic law that's a big ask 
Yeah. At least they're ratified and the judiciary do pay attention to them as soft law and they have an obligation to take them into account. Um, now, it was very interesting that Wales has incorporated the U United Nations Convention in the Rights of the Child and I have no doubt that Scotland um, have also been ahead of, in terms of the incorporation of some of those standards. Yeah. Um, and certainly in terms of GB, the Single Equality Act already exists so, and we don't have that. Um, and uh, that's something else you may want to consider. Yeah. Is that disability legislation is already in place. And indeed, you know, there are issues around accessibility, um, which came up earlier. Um, and, and so there are, are statutory duties already on your government, our government, to, to pay attention to that. So the question would be, what extra does the Bill of Rights bring? And that's okay. where you would want to look at the instruments those instruments and where the gap lies. Okay, okay. No, that makes sense. Um, I suppose, just going back to the Bill of Rights Forum in 2007, 2008, and that was the first time I had heard the term really things in square brackets. And uh, when we think about the um, FICT draft FICT report, which obviously hasn't been published yet, and there's apparently there's a lot of square brackets in that as well. You know, I, I've been concerned from the start about how we actually get to the point where we, we're we not continuing to debate this, but we can actually have a finished um, document product to give to the people of Northern Ireland because all the evidence we've had from different sections of society really, really are championing and wanting us to do this. So I suppose, is there any more advice around how we can actually, you know, remove a lot of the square brackets that potentially could, could be there going forward and that were there in the past? It's very difficult um, to answer that question without seeing what you're proposing. Um, and I know it was very difficult for me, Paula, when the Bill of Rights Forum presented me with two reports, not one, and set out two options. And I was left with the decision, which one of these am I meant to uh, interpret? Um, and But we included it because it was another piece of evidence. Um, and the square brackets, I certainly know, were there in the last week of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, right up until the very last minute, there were square brackets around lots of things. Um, so it, they were negotiated as a compromise. But it's more difficult for your committee because human rights shouldn't really be about a compromise. You should be doing the right thing. Um, and that's where your biggest decision of all is going to come into play. It's, going, it's a very difficult one. Um, but you're in a much better place. Your committee is in a much better place. I'm very heartened very heartened to see your committee at work and to see the deliberations that are taking place. And my last words in my briefing to you were that it was a privilege and a duty to be asked to do this. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine someday to say to your grandchildren, I was there and maybe the square brackets got taken off? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I suppose um, that's exactly where I am, that we should not be trying to put square brackets around human rights and where some people might see some of these as conscience issues. I, I think that if they're human rights and they're, you know, international standards, then, then we, should, we shouldn't be trying to force them down that. Um, and I suppose that the last thing to say, you know, I, I am still a little bit concerned about the sort of the green and orange line that might come around this um, issue. But do do you, are you saying that you think that we're in a better place than maybe we were in two thousand and eight or nineteen ninety eight in terms of where society is and where sort of broad church unionism or broad church nationalism is in terms of um, these issues? Most definitely. And um, time is a great healer. Now I hope you don't regress or revert because of Brexit. Uh, because there were circumstances that came left stage that none of us could have predicted. Um, and for me, the peace agreement spoke a lot about our connections to European law and directives. Um, and there's something you're going to have to look at if they get removed. Well, does, what vacuum does that create for you? Particularly as a woman in the women's movement in the 70s. I benefited greatly from the Equal Pay Act and the Sex Discrimination Act. And most of those directives were from Europe. Now, they didn't come in through the UK government. Um, and so I was very pleased that they were incorporated into law. Um, now, you, what you have to look at is what no democracy should ever do is to regress on human rights. That's That would be a very undemocratic thing to do. 
So you have um, a bank of rights there currently. The Human Rights Act review should not be allowed to regress on those basic rights. They are basic. You could write them all in one page. Um, and likewise for the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, what we had to be really careful about doing was to make sure that we didn't impact on the current legislation, for instance, on the Fair Employment Act and the Sex Discrimination Act or any of the um, Equality Acts by the recommendations that we were making. Because they're already enshrined, they're in place, and you're meant to be building on them as protections and because of the particular circumstances. So that's, that's my advice to you. Uh, ensure there's no regression and I'm certainly sure as political representatives you would not none of you would want that to happen um, the question would be which rights are you then um, agreeing on that are ad are additional um, and that's where I'm not certain I wish I was that you had now got political agreement on on, on those rights you have a lot of work still to do on those issues as you know, and I've been following all those debates, mm -hmm. and I have to say in the week of International Women's Day, I was very heartened to see the debate in the Assembly on Monday. Mm -hmm. It would never have taken place in my time. There wouldn't have been a space for such a discussion. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I don't think we've got any other members in the kitten so yes, at this you point. Yes, you do. Sorry, that's the great I'm I haven't actually intended to say much um, because I've talked to Michael about some of these things before, but I, I, I felt compelled to um, follow the previous speaker. I just want to say, if we don't have conscience, then what do we have? And I think people should always act in accordance with their conscience. People will have different. Um, views uh, on things, of course they will. We live in a democracy, but I think, <laughs> I think it is important to respect if people have a conscience on a particular issue, that's not necessarily a fault. Some people will have a conscience different from mine on a, on a very wide range of issues. I respect the right to have a conscience and to speak accordingly um, to it. The, the question that I, I wanted to ask, because I think you were right to to raise just the process that we're, we're going through presently and how if we hope to bring this one to a sort of successful conclusion and a, and a soft landing, as it were, what do you think the chief failings were in previous processes, Monica? Good question, and it's very easy to answer. Parties were at each other's throats on these issues. And yeah. because it wasn't a devolved matter, it was kicked to Westminster. And it didn't come down to the assembly. It was a reserved matter. There wasn't, uh, people were not au fait, Christopher, with what is meant by the freedom of movement, for instance, in terms of parading. Hmm. And it's a, a really important right. And no one wants to take anybody's freedom of movement away. But I think in my time at the Forum uh, for Dialogue and Understanding, there was huge contention over that issue. In a way, perhaps there isn't now because we understand the need for arbitration and mediation and the understanding of people's rights in relation to that in particular would be one such right. Um, we had only just come out of conflict, very bitter conflict. Um, and so we hadn't an agreed narrative on what caused that conflict. Mm. Uh, and when people sit down to draft a human rights instrument, they tend to generally have an agreed narrative on what went wrong and what needs to be put right for the future. So we have contested narratives, in fact, multiple narratives. Um, well, at least more than one, so that would make it multiple. Um, and so that has to be addressed. Um, and also those issues of um, people believing that there was another issue that people felt responsibilities were more important than people's rights. That was another part of the debate. Um, and therefore... You know, the government is doing right by you. It does these things anyway. Um, why should you look for more? Um, and, of course, you can turn that argument back like you did earlier in terms of disability and in terms of your own child. Your child is a child. You can't put that responsibility on your child. Mm. Your child has that right. But people didn't understand that either. 
Um, so that, those are all contested, very contested issues that I came across. But the most important one was that parties would not sit around the table on this issue in the way that you're now doing. I think, I mean, my, my, my degrees in history, and if there was an agreed interpretation of history, nobody would need to do a history degree. Um, you know, I think there's always going to be uh, different schools of thought around historical um, events. In terms of the, the balance, you mentioned the argument around a lot of the rights that people have are already protected. I mean, Section 75, and you mentioned equal pay. All of those rights are already in domestic legislation. Where do you think the balance lies then in terms of this process representing a codifying of that which is already there or additional innovation and adding? And if you think that there is scope for additional innovation and adding, in, in what areas do you see that? Well, I think our um, advice would was very well explained in terms of that, what was supplementary. Um, I mean, if you just think about it, the right to be British, Irish or both, it's there. But is it actually enshrined? And you saw the difficulty that Emma de Souza had in terms of the, the issue became one of um, that fell back to the Home Office and immigration. But that question would now be asked of people on both sides, irrespective of the constitutional arrangements um, that the future may hold. You have the right to be British, you have the right to be Irish, or both. Now, do you codify that? Or do you simply leave that out there that everybody understands that to be a right? Um, so, but in terms of additional rights, I think um, the, the mandate itself was very clear, and you raised some of that in terms of your question to me about equality rights. Well, there were other equality rights that needed to be addressed, um, and we stipulated those. Um, and so, but of course, people then would ask, are travellers in Northern Ireland discriminated against? Is there legislation on that? And so our rights simply said that it should not, it's equality of all before the law. And if there is law, so be it. But if there needs to be a, an extra protection, so that that law is not infringed, then it's it's in the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Okay. That's very useful. Thank you. And uh, and your response to the issue of conscience, they had the same issue in, in 1948 when they sat down to draft the Universal Declaration. Exactly the same issue. And it was an even more interesting issue in that the capitalist country said, it's only political and civil rights that need to be protected. And therefore, we will put those into the Universal Declaration. The, um, the Soviet countries and the um, more socialist inclined countries said, but our conscience tells us that it must be social and economic rights that need to be protected. So there was a clash of conscience around which rights were the most important and which oh. needed the most protection. And then, and then on religion, there's a bigger issue again in terms of ethics. And that's already come up in terms of the law and, and judicial hearings on that issue. And I think that, that clash of conscience is being played out in this process, and that's where I think you're right in terms of um, isolating those areas where there's agreement and then thrashing out the others is probably the most sensible way. Um, and that is going to take a considerable time if we're going to get it right. So um, thank you. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. I hope you do get it right. Northern Ireland needs you to get it right. I said right, not right wing. <laughs> <laughs> no, Christopher, you come over to the dark side. You're working for us. You come to us. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Christopher, the debate took place in Parliament buildings in 1966. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to complete your work in 2022. <laughs> Um, so I think we've given it an awful long time to get it right. Um, yeah. And there's a heavy responsibility on your shoulders to probably now do the right thing and get it right. So I wish you well in that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. If there's no one else, I think we have... We've got everybody. Monica, thank you very much for your presentation and for your time answering questions this afternoon and for, for joining us. And uh, 
given us some of your expertise. I um, really appreciate that. So just want to thank you on behalf of the committee and we'll let you take your evening and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very belated happy International Women's Day, but we're still in the same week, so I'm wishing you those good wishes. Thank you. Bye. Brilliant. Okay, members, we can now move on to the next Next item on our agenda this afternoon, Chair's Business, and just um, the, the only item that we have to discuss today is at last week's meeting, um, I had given formal notice of a proposal to rescind the committee's earlier decision to conclude the taking of evidence um, on the 29th of April and extend that out until the 6th of May instead. I think there was agreement, but just to formally note that, is everyone content with that? Great. Great, thanks. Chair, could I raise an issue? I, a previous meeting, had suggested, and I don't know whether or not anything has happened or um, I had a previous meeting had suggested the committee get in touch with faith groups in terms of giving evidence. And um, I may have missed it, but I'm just wondering, is there any update on where that's at? And specifically, I mean, not wanting to exclude any faith group that wants to give us evidence, but specifically uh, the Roman Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church in Ireland, Church of Ireland, Methodists, um, sort of mainstream religious denominations, but also obviously representatives of the Jewish community or the Islamic community wanted to make representation to us. I think it would be useful to hear from them. Yep, Christopher. So the, the stakeholder events, I'm not sure which of the dates that it is. I don't have the oh, uh, calendar. Sorry, I'm not the so, no, well, we're, we're going on to that now. So th that, that's the, the next thing we had discussed last week, the stakeholder events. So there's different categories of groups and the faith groups are included in one of those sessions. But the clerk had advised that she had, I think, written out to everyone with that calendar. And we had discussed it last week, if members could make them a, themselves available. So she just asked me to read reiterate this afternoon if people want to go back to that email to say when they're available i think myself and mike have committed to most of the sessions it's just going to be a half an hour at the end of the two year long session and if, if people can make themselves available that we have a few of us every day rather than just one rep from the, the committee that's grand thank you but because for additional to that because we have extended that out for a week if there's somebody that you know of that might want to present in the same format that we had like the presentations this afternoon they're free to Right done, and then we could, you know, take a one-on-one -on -one session. So you can say that no there's somebody that you're, that you're speaking to. Um, then the the next thing, then so it, it, everyone is content. Then that they'll take a week, look at that email, and go back to the clerk. Yeah. So the next item on our agenda is our draft minutes. Are members uh, content with the minutes from the fourth of March? Ten, chair. Brilliant. Item number six is matters arising. I don't have any matters arising. And then item number seven is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo beginning at page 65 of your meeting pack. Um, we've got an answer back from the executive office in relation to the appointment of the panel of experts. And we have got uh, a letter from a citizen around our meeting last week and a letter from the UK Supreme Court telling us that they are willing to present to the committee on the 22nd of April. So if everyone is content to note that and also offer up any suggestions of topics that they might want to discuss with the reps from the UK Supreme Court because they will uh, have specific things that they'll not want to discuss. So the clerk has advised that if, if people have something in mind that they want to discuss, it might be helpful to email that through in advance. Is everyone content with that? I don't know if everyone has frozen or have I frozen? No, grand. No, grand. Brilliant. Okie dokie. So the next thing then is our forward work programme. If people uh, can content, are content to agree, the forward work programme begin on page 71. And then in Gruella, does anybody have any other business? I don't think so. So that allows us to conclude our meeting. Oh, I can hear Sorry. It. Sorry. 
Yeah, and it was just in relation to obviously last week's comments with regards to the potential committee motion for the 21st and 22nd. I see that's still in there. And I suppose mindful of the comments that were made by, by Monica in our, our last session, just whether that may be reviewed then even for next week's meeting. Yeah. Uh, in terms just Sorry, in, terms, in, in terms of the time scale for the potential motion to the plenary, obviously that's still in our forward work program for the 21st and 22nd of June. And I'm just mindful of those comments that, that were made with Monica in the previous session and also the fact that I raised that at last week's meeting as well. Yeah, I know you had, Michelle, and we had agreed at, at last week's meeting that we would play it by ear and see how we get on. Do, do you want to propose a new sort of um, ambition in terms of a time frame? Well, well I, I, do, I, sort of, I, I suppose I was thinking that perhaps that should be taken out at this stage as well, because I, I do think that there's probably um, quite a bit of discussion that needs to take place. And, and obviously there are still some other groups, as you've indicated, that may we may want to speak to um, as we even go through that type of... Um, scrutiny at that stage as well um so I'm, I'm just mindful that you know we may be overly ambitious for that date sure yeah carl so i mean i i obviously it's a committee motion so it'll be on uh, no day name plus i'm assuming so if a if I'm picking Michelle up, right, it's a matter of just we will do a motion, even if it's like a take note debate, whatever, whatever you know the standing order is. But it might be better to wait until all the evidence is done. We'll do that, like a take note debate, and then we'll come back to you. Obviously, our report at some stage or other, because I imagine it'll not be the only time we'll be in the assembly. To be honest with with this. Yeah. So. As we have just previously agreed there, our, our last date for taking evidence was the 28th of April, and then I had suggested that we put an extension on that, and we've now agreed that it's the 6th of May. So yeah. I think w allowing that to remain on our forward work programme, and that is our time frame that we're working to, and if we don't meet that, that, that we then have, a, whether it be a take note debate or, or a suggestion of it, I don't... I don't know if it's appropriate to, to remove it off the forward work program now because I think having a date there gives us it gives us two months of, of time to, to work on this and we have got the draft that we had previously agreed with the, the clerk and I think it gives us that wee bit of structure and if we don't manage to have the report finalised by that we don't but I, w I wouldn't like us to remove a, a time frame and something to work towards. Yeah. No, I'm not suggesting removing it, Chair. I'm just suggesting that we're have it in our heads that we all need to commit to these stakeholder events in order to get the evidence in uh, to meet that. And I'm also saying that it shouldn't be the only opportunity we're coming back to the Assembly to have a debate in this issue because there could be a couple of opportunities to do it. You know, some people may want to put written evidence in or whatever. And But anyway, um, we do need a date to focus, it, but we also need to try and get through all this work as well. So I'm I'm okay. The one thing I would say, Chair, is I think that if we, if we, um, I'm not going to say, well, yeah, we'll say rush. If we rush, um, there will be square brackets galore on any sort of report that is presented to the Assembly. And um, I, I think that it is important, given what um, Professor McWilliams said, and given the, the feelings that there were in other processes, I think it is important that we do allow sufficient time in order to allow, because it'll, it certainly will not be simply the, the nine members serving on this committee who will decide in terms of the content of anything, um, you know, and stuff's gonna have to be taken away to parties and stuff like that. I just think it is important that we get the timing on this, right? Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I don't care anybody disagreeing, but the only issue for me is, like Christopher, say if we went forward, just to use the example of a technical debate, I'm not suggesting that's a format we do it, just to give, you know, people, particularly parties who aren't on here, you know, you have a debate, people say what they have to say, but we still have an awful lot of work to do regardless. So, um, 
and you know yourself, um, we do need to take time to get a report done um, because I don't think any of us want this to end the same way the the Human Rights Commission um, debacle did. So for all all those reasons, um, so so that's my own thoughts. Okay. Right. I'm just conscious now we have lost quorum and we are still in live session. So, I mean, this this had been agreed, this date of a report date or a, a, an assembly motion had been agreed back in February. So we would need to have a formal motion to rescind that. So I think at last week's committee, it was agreed that we would proceed on that basis. And if we need to rescind that, we, we would have to do that at another date. But we can't agree this now, so um, I, I think we should we should close it off at this point. And if we want to to discuss again, we can when we have quorum. Are people content with that? Yes, if we've got if we haven't got quorum, then that's, we haven't got quorum. <laughs> All you right, everybody off, Christopher. You scored them. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Sometimes. <laughs> see you later then. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.